Well, hello and welcome to Apologetics 101. I'm your host, Christian Paul Brian Keith Bowen, and, and welcome to the Genesis series. And today, we are going to be uh, examining the fossil evidence again, like we did with Dr. Bergman. But this time, we're going to take a closer look at the fossils, and we're going to get some specifics in, and we're going to be looking at uh, a specific cast of fossils and fossil skulls that... Uh, that uh, Dr. Peter Lyon has, and he's going to be uh, showcasing some of these, and he's going to be discussing specifics involving things like Lucy's hip and and uh, pelvis area and so forth. And so we're going to get very very into some some specifics. We're going to be taking a much closer look at the fossil evidence. And so uh, without further ado, uh, let's dive in. Well, hello, and we're here today with Dr. Peter Lyon um, from Australia, which is the farthest I've ever actually uh, um, I've had one of these Zoom meetings, um, <laughs> uh, and he's 15 hours away, I believe, uh, from me, uh, so it's like 8 o'clock in the morning there, isn't it? That's correct, yeah. <laughs> So, um, do you do you live like close to the outback? I know some people might think all of Australia is outback. <laughs> do you live somewhere close to the outback, or? Well, I live I live on the outskirts of Melbourne, the city. So, but but you don't have to go too far to to sort of be in. Uh, uh, I you guess. You see any kangaroos? Yeah, well, not not around here, but it, you know, you can go. You, you can. Go for a drive, and uh, if you want to see some, but you know, but 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 not around here. Yeah, yeah. Hey, we don't get any kangaroos around here. Um, <laughs> <don't>. <laughs> All right, awesome. Oh, I, I meant to wear my uh, my Indiana Jones hat because it reminded me of uh, Crocodile Dundee. But I took a I look at it. Uh, you know who Crocodile Dundee is? Yeah, yeah, Korean, yeah. Famous Australian. Uh, his hat's like uh black though, but uh, I got like an Indiana Jones hat that's like brown. Okay. My Indiana Jones hat because it's brown and it's a fedora. Yeah. It's like Indiana Jones. <laughs> I was gonna wear it. <laughs> say, say, okay. All right, but anyway, right. um, okay. Uh, we're gonna start off with an introduction before we uh jump into the uh uh, uh questions. Um, so would you like to introduce yourself? I know you're new to my channel. And just uh, um, tell everybody briefly um, your educational background, your area of expertise. You know what you're working on. Anything of that okay. uh, nature. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so my my name is Peter Lyon, and my background is I got a, a bachelor degree in, in biophysics and instrumental science, and a master's degree and, and a doctorate in, in neuroscience, where I looked at uh, brain electrophysiology, recording things from the brain, and it, imaging them and stuff like that and and so I did sort of research for that for a decade or so and uh, then I sort of taught a, a, a secular university sort of in the anatomy physiology area for a, over a decade or so and thankfully uh, I'm not uh, doing that anymore I'm a bit, a bit retired uh, but um, I've always had an interest in the, the uh, so-called ape man or hominin fossils uh, because uh, to me, uh, I think one, I think actually once uh, I went to um, in a library at university in my early days, and I and I had an interest, in, and I looked at this uh, picture, some skulls. I, I think they were just some rope. They were whether they were a robust strapiferous skulls. I'm not sure, or some Chinese skulls. But I looked at one of the assistants in the librarian there, and he. And his eyes lit up. He just saw this picture, and, and it, it looked to me like, oh, that proves he didn't have to say anything. It was, it was just a one look, and oh, that that's a, that's an ape man, you know. If you understand what I mean, 
And I just realised then at an early stage what effect this sort of propaganda has on people. If you don't know the story behind it, then it's very easy for people to, to get sold on a story that we evolved from some ape and that uh, basically which would rule out there being a God, at least the God of the Bible. And so, I, be, you know, so after I became a Christian, I, I, I became a Christian... Um, it's actually through creation because I, I was, I I used to be into really sports and triathlons, and I remember uh, one day I was out there thinking about this this question: Does God exist? Uh, and and he'd answer some. I, I sort of prayed the Lord Prayer every night, but I wasn't a Christian. And he, but it, I'd even asked, put him, put him, uh, said something to him. I won't go into it, but I, I'd said something to him. If this happens, I'll never be able to deny you exist. Then that thing happened, and then I got reminded of that a few months later. And then I thought, well, yeah, but if, if how can it be if um, God if you if you if God created us from from the dust of the ground, and man and man says that you know obviously that we came from you know the the uh, the fish the um, reptiles then the mammals and the apes and the man we evolved, those two can't be both true. So I, I once, so I boldly said to God, well, I said, look, God, if you really are God, then you have the power to solve this problem. I so, so thought, well, anyhow. So I left it at that. But a few months later, I started at university. And then um, I got interested in life for origin. And then for some reason, I kind of forgotten about that incident, what I, what I said to God. But he hadn't forgotten. I think there, there was a series of origins at the university, I actually thought it was an evolution, but so I thought, oh, what's the point? Because at that stage, I become a bit skeptical because there was all these different theories about how life originated, but no way I know any truth. But I went along with one, and then I heard this uh, person, uh, Dr. Wilder Smith, who'd got three doctors in chemistry. He started explaining how um, natural selection and assorting mutation it couldn't explain how life evolved. And that's when a scale dropped from my eyes. And I realized God had answered my question. And so I, I didn't become a Christian then, but I became a creationist then, <laughs> if you understand that. And and later yeah. on, some months later, when I I became a Christian, uh, I, I won't go into that, but I had a pretty uh, sort of amazing, uh, scary dream. And I didn't understand it, but... I surrendered my life to Christ and um, it wasn't sort of, I didn't go to church or anything like that. Just, but yeah, I, uh, so anyhow, that, that's my, that's my kind of background. But like I said, if uh, people, like I said, that librarian looking at this, this skull in this uh, journal, basically it, it was like he was sold on it. I don't know where he was, but that's how it appeared to me. And so later on when I thought, you're going to if you're going to do be involved in these things, maybe it's best to focus in one area. So I decided I'll focus on uh, this area, a grey area, uh, because uh, that's where it's harder to because you can prove. Uh, I believe these days you can prove that um, evolution is falsified uh, from molecular biology, genetics. Uh, you probably have familiar with genetic genetic entry, the waiting time problem, irreducible complexity. All these arguments, I destroy it. There's no, you, you can't, you know, it's just, I, I study the brain, the brain, you know, uh, almost infinite in functional complexity, and we don't even know what the mind is. And that, that's non-physical, but even the physical part of the brain, all the, the, the nerve connections, you know, um, it, it's just unbelievable, you know. Uh, just like me, me and you uh, sitting here talking here, you know, everything we see, we hear, it, it basically, it goes to the brain, and it, it it's just current sent down from your uh, optic nerves from from the retina, or or basic um, say with the vision, and there's about a, do a couple of dozen or so centers in your brain that g gets part of the signal, whether it's you know color, edge detection, things like that, reconstruct the whole signal, and then merges it with your, your what you you're hearing your smell or whatever 
so that you can actually essentially experience it in real time. How do you select for something like that? How how on earth do you get that into the genetic code? It's it's a miracle, and that's just one of the one of the things in the brain is just so. And I've never met any brain side. I've met a lot of smart people, but I've never met anyone who has any clue as to how the brain functions. And if you get them quietly, they'll admit so too. <laughs> that it's just beyond mm. beyond belief. And and so, um, so I, I'm interested in the brain, but to me, that's a that's a simple one. I like the more difficult ones. And and so this that the because the fossils you can't. It's it's hard. Although we can now analyze ancient DNA, so that's in some ways. But a lot of these fossils aren't. You can't get the DNA out of them. But uh, it's it, just just the skull itself. You can kind of. Um, uh, it says I think it was a quote by someone that fossils are fickle. You can, or they'll sing it, any song you want, and basically that's what's happening. You get these skulls or these bones and. People are making all these interpretations, and and then someone else makes a different interpretation on the same amount of bones, and and you know because because um, to to tell what narrative or story they want. So anyhow, that's probably enough for my for my background. Um, but yeah, are you associated with any particular ministry? I heard that you write for CMIs and Downs. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm I'm involved in uh, with, with uh, Creation Ministry International. And and my my writings on the fossils mainly uh, it's 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 on uh, it's on uh, creation it's creation dot com forward slash peter uh, a hyphen line I think that's what the the um, my web the web page where all my articles are together so you, you can that's where that's where uh, um, now I have written probably you're familiar. With Jerry Bergman, a book here. So, I, but that that way, so it's called uh, Apes as Ancestors. So, a lot a lot of stuff is a lot of detail in here. Yeah, you got that. So that so that um, that you won't find there. But a lot of a lot of the articles. Are, and so I tried and I got some stuff coming out. So I write mostly in the journal of creation. Sometimes in the creation magazine, but usually in journal of creation. So. I have a couple articles coming out um, in uh, the end of the year. One on one in which uh, I can get it here. A review of this massive book, the Human Lineage by this is a, by evolutionists. So it's a, that goes through all the fossil evidence. So I reviewed that book. Uh, that's a, that's by evolutionists, but I reviewed that book. And another one is on the developments of. Um, Paying for biology, I, I kind of do a sort of like a series of that where I update the latest findings. So, so basically, describe a lot of the interesting findings. So, for example, in the I look at the what's coming out of the rising star cave system in South Africa with these hominolidi and and uh, you know uh, in terms of them, did they make engravings on on cave walls? Did they bury their dead? Did they make fire yeah. and That's stuff like that? Too. So. Let's not move too far ahead because we're going to be getting into all that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, all right. Um, I guess some uh, some general comments about, um, okay, a lot of these uh, fossils are being presented as transitional fossils. Uh, could you define mm -hmm. what a transitional fossil is and whether or not, if you think this is, is a transitional fossil, um, how would you... Um, I mean, I, I know you have certain views on this, and we're going to get into those, but and we're going to get into some yeah. specifics as well. But um, yeah. I, I just want to kind of a general understanding. You know, uh, how would you define transitional fossils? Whether these would qualify, what to look for to to see if if something is a transitional. Uh, sometimes that that the, the, they'll yeah. claim these things are intermediates when they're actually not intermediates, but you know. Um, yeah. Uh, well, so how how would you do that? How would you explain that? Uh, well, I, uh, well, I think I I I, I kind of well, basically uh, the sort of dictionary definition is, is fossil exhibiting traits uh, common or or intermediate to both its alleged ancestral group and its derived or descendant group. So basically, uh, one I, I, a fossil that has characters of both 
its alleged ancestor and its alleged descendant. So that is sort of what, in I guess, what evolutionists would say is a is a transitional fossil. But um, I don't. I, of course, I don't accept that. And the thing is, um, you can. Uh, everybody ha living today, you know, has ancestors, and, and many have descendants, and possess traits of their ancestors, and passes some on to the descendants. But but there'll be a different combination of traits as the, as the the mixed genes are mixed up, and that's the way I look at it. But it's not evolution, you know, because um, that evolution uh, and for the reason about genetics is that you you got to get the information in there, a new information, not existing information, and that's the problem. The the waiting time problem it takes forever and a day to get this new information in there, and by the time you, you it, it, theoretically you get if you could ever do it, the problem is that the gene is uh, building up with bad um, mutations. You know, roughly hundreds hundred mutations per person per generation is is in is um, built is is sort of built up in a in a genome and uh, and and Dr. John Sanford's work on genetic entropy basically shows that most of these you can't get rid of. So it's like rust rust on a car. A little bit it's okay, but it's as as it keeps on building up, eventually the you know the door's going to come off and things like that. So yeah, so, so basically uh, yeah, interesting. It, 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 uh... Interesting, the uh, uh, um, uh, the amount of mutation rates based on the uh, time frame that the evolutionists give, even within yeah. that time frame, there hasn't been enough time or, or the, the, the mutation rates, it would have accumulated a lot more than what they have if, if you know, yeah. that much time. And so I guess they're trying to push it back, try to, as far as they can, try to give enough time to to do that. But um um, it, it, it it just doesn't work because even yeah. I think in in say from uh, the the alleged common ancestor of of chimps and humans, say it was six six or so million years ago, whatever it was. At the most, at the most, if you had if you work it out, you could have uh, being kind. Maybe you get a thousand uh, mutations fixed in a genome where where they are on each chromosome of all individuals, so it's established as part of the population. But the problem is the difference between us and chimps. If if there's a what is three billion um, um, nucleotides or, or or DNA letters in our genome, so if there's a one percent difference, that's still thirty million different thirty million mutations or thirty million letter differences, not one thousand. But according to Jeffrey. Jeffrey Tom, Dr. Tompkins, I think, yeah, it's more like it could be a, the, the difference could be considerable, considerable, maybe 15% or more, which would make it like, you know, uh, uh, 300, 400, 450 million uh, base pair differences. And there's no way you could get that fixed in um, by any evolutionary mechanisms, natural selection, sorting out in six million years, you were not in six trillion years. So it just uh, it, it doesn't work, right. you know. Right. And but the, the problem is that people, most people, don't understand these arguments, and and so they're not they it does they they ne they're never exposed to it. So these lies can be built up, you know, and and around it because it's like you. The people don't get exposed to this information, sadly. Yeah, a lot of evolutionists don't even read it. Uh, they have a bad habit of not reading what we write, or when they do, yeah. they tend to misrepresent what we actually say, and that makes things even worse. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. because yeah. The, the information is not getting out there as a result, or misinformation is getting out there. True. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Uh, of course, Charles Darwin recognized uh, the lack of transitional to be a problem. The fact that the, the, the entire chains of transitionals is missing from the fossil uh, evidence. And so a lot of evolutionists are just kind of scrambling around to try to find that evidence in the fossil evidence. And uh, so there are a lot of, uh, now granted, most evolutionary scientists probably would not actually accept these as transitionals per se, but a lot of lay evolutionists will say, they're transitionals 
And so, you know, um, but you would say that the, these are not actually transitional uh, species and that sort of thing, that they're not in between states. They're not le uh, one step leading to the next step to leading to the next no. step, going all the way to human, uh, to homo sapiens. It's variation. variation, variation within the biblical kind. Right. All right. Um, I guess some general consideration because there's uh, while we're already on the subject matter, Australopithecines. Um, yes. What was the first Australopithecine that was found? What did the evolutionists say about this, and what what do they think about it? Uh, well, if the first one was the uh, known as the Tong Child, uh, which is which was later assigned to a species I call Australopithecus africanus, and it was sort of. Uh, the uh, well, I won't go for the whole whole uh, the, st the story, but uh, basically, uh, um, some um, uh, whatever it's from a mine or whatever, but anyhow, some workmen brought brought or someone brought some some basically rocks and stuff to Raymond Dart, who was a professor or, or teacher of anatomy in in um, South Africa, and if and amongst these uh, things or fossils, he in his rocks or whatever, he, he found this uh, um, thing that looked kind of like apish, but maybe it wasn't a chimp. And and it was a juvenile, two, three-year-old, and it had sort of the, the face and and uh, the part of the skull, but also the endocasters inside of the brain and the jaw. And uh, and basically, uh, I think I think it was just the yeah. I don't know what how much of the I can't remember exactly the. Uh, how much of the skull was, but the, but the face was there and 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 the jaw, and so he sort of um, that was he, he sort of I guess claimed to fame that this was a miss, missing link basically, and so I don't have a copy of that uh, that skull here. My friend has what has it, but I don't have it. But it, it's just sort of um, it, it it's a sort of juvenile juvenile so. Because it's juvenile, it's even harder to make any determination. Because as as they grow older, the, the shape would change a bit. But but I you know, I accept it probably wasn't Austro Australopithecus africanus. But that that species, I I I look at uh, from so my my view on the Australopithecines, which generally a lot of the a lot of basically most of these so so called ape men or hominins can be put in the category. If they're not human, um, either if they're very so only a few maybe can be, I would class as apes. But most of the Australopithecines, I, I class them as ape extinct apish primates. So whilst they're apish, <coughs> like like in 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 terms of how they were, they were in, in fact um, evolutionist and anatomist Charles Oxnard probably said something best uh, so I'll, I'll quote from him he, he says um so he this guy knew a lot i still have still alive i believe so he knows a lot about that he said the various australopithecus things are indeed more different from both african apes and humans in most features than these latter are from each other so he analyzed a lot so that's quote is from the fossils chief and, and sex his book um and he said they're unique and i Tend to believe that is to it's better to look them at as a unique primate group, not necessarily like we view because there are fossil apes as well, a lot of them found in Europe uh, and things like that. So, but they were kind of different from existing apes and uh, and different from humans as well. But they were apes a bit a bit like you don't say monkeys are apes. But they're not humans, but they're primates. So that's uh, that's how I look at look at the Australopithecines because their skulls were, uh, you know, I got a I get a chimp skull here. I get a lot of skulls here, so I don't fall over. So here's a here's a chimpanzee skull, and now so you can see here that's a chimpanzee skull. Okay, now let me get a um. An Australopithecine skull. This is a male uh, Australopithecus afarensis skull. Okay, so let's see if I can hold them up together. It's a bit tricky. Okay, so here, 
you can see here, here are the two. Actually, maybe I should put, oh no, it's all right. Is that one on the left of Fossil? Is that just a cast or what? Uh, the, the, um, the this one, one here. Right, yeah. On your yeah, right. that's a, yeah, that's a, that's a car, cast, a real, cast of a real fossil, this one here. So that's the, uh, that's the, um, I think it's AL40, AL, hang on, AL44 uh, hyphen 2. Is the brown what they found, or is that what they added? The the gray is what I found, and okay. the, the orange brown is what they've kind of filled in the in the gaps. So there's there's nothing really human. Uh, that, the, the the discoverers point out some things that make him less apish, but in the end, it's not. It's a very apish skull, but it's not. But it's well, it's a very non-human skull. But I wouldn't. I wouldn't sort of call it basically. I wouldn't say it's a chimpanzee skull. It's very. It's different from a chimpanzee skull as well. But you that's say that and, that and then along with their postcranial anatomy, you, I I tend to believe they're better off classed as a separate primate group rather than mix them together with apes. And uh, in in that sense, of, although they're apish, so so, but it's easier. Because they're extinct, it's easy just to, to put them in that category and talk to, talk about them as they're a, a different group. And and okay, an ape like an ape is an ex, uh, uh, as a um, um, species of uh, primate, pretty much um, yeah. uh, a type of primate. And so, yes. of course, there's a type of primate called great apes, which is what uh, chimpanzees are considered. Uh, yeah. great apes. And so uh, you would say that uh, um, that although this particular extinct primate has similar uh, attributes to that of ape, uh, I believe you described it as apish, uh, yeah. that that it's not an actual ape. That because of the dis the distinctions within the the like the skulls and things like that that you've examined, the, there's obviously some fundamental differences that would make this its own species. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, there, there, there's, there's a, there's, it's not, it's also sort of evolutionists like Charles Oxnard have done a lot of analysis on it and shown there's, there's, a, there's a difference between that and apes, and certainly differences between that and humans, but also different, yeah, uh, between the humans and the Australopithecine, certainly. So, so, but it's just, and for me, I just find it easier to to just group them separately, and there's a lot of diversity within the Australopithecines. So I don't even know whether they're one or, or more biblical kinds, but there, there's a lot of diversity. Um, but I, I think uh, uh, maybe we'll get to it later. But I, I think a lot, even some evolutionists believe a lot of the stuff that is even some of the stuff put in a genus Homo, which which um, like Homo habilis uh, is basically belong to the Australopithecines. It's been uh, because of sort of um, they, they try to want to make ape men and, and they're basically having something in the uh, homo genus um, that is not Australopithecine, but it but, uh, looks good to them. But really, um, a lot of those homo bills are just Australopithecines and they're, they're ba ba basically they believe they're, they're wrongly classified as homo habilis, and even some evolutionists believe they should either be in their own genus or put in the, you know, the Australopithecines. Most of them, there may be, a, there may, there may be a few that uh, remains that belong to Homo erectus, um, but uh, some of the postcranial stuff which doesn't have a, a cranium, like the leg bones, of <coughs> femurs and stuff, which are attributed to Homo habilis, may be Homo erectus. You don't know because it because you don't. <laughs> I'd like to ask you a question about uh, some people suggest that that some of these species could be made up because of being chimeras, which basically simply means other fossils being mixed in with them. And because uh, even Dr. Bergman suggests this because he because these are being found over a a wide area. So um, would you say, I mean, like example in the case of Lucy, they actually discovered that one of the bones was that from a baboon, and it wasn't even from, you know, the original specimen. Would you say that that you're not? Uh, would you agree that that they, that there could be fossils that that is a danger that paleoanthropologists have to face that because these are being found with other bones over a wide area 
that could get mixed in with other fossils and that sort of thing. And so there's issues there, but you would still argue that the part that is clearly, you know, so like say, for example, the skull of Australopithecine is still that extinct ape. Um, how how would you how would you look at that situation? Yeah, I I think that yeah you, you could get things commingle and stuff like that. Of course, the, the thing things are mixed up. I mean, um, if you look how Homo habilis was discovered, it was it was found with all sorts of creatures, not just uh, primates, but uh, was it turtles or tortoises or all sorts of things mixed up with it. So so you yeah you can get that. Um, I think each fossil has its. You got to look at the context of each fossils really. And then see um, how how do, how does the individual bits fit? If they do, they all fit that fossil together. Um, if no, if so, let me let me just go because it's going to come up anyhow. So so basically, I think one of the issues is the the pelvis of of Lucy. This is the Af afarensis pelvis. Now um, you can see I'll get a human. This is a human pelvis. On the, Okay, the white one is the human pelvis, and uh, so it's, so this is generally a, a not a not a massive. It's described as not massive. This female pelvis, but this is Lucy, so it's much smaller. Um, now, in 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 this now, let me show you what a a chimp pelvis look like. That's the chimpanzee pelvis. Okay, so the. So the first thing is I, I don't think it, to the um, so we'll put it this way around okay to, so, so even mm -hmm. to the untrained eye you can see these two are different the the Lucy this pelvis here Lucy that that said to be Lucy's is not like a chimp's you can see that this tall um, hip bones here and this sort of very thin sacrum here where we're basically the spine. You, you, which attaches the spine to the pelvic girdle here. So, but um, is, um, is the is the is I guess the question is: Could this be commingled? Could this could this pelvis be mixed up with uh, the other bones of Lucy? Um, well, it, I guess my thing is I, I I don't believe so because because they kind of yeah there was a baboon uh, was it I think was it a vertebra or something that got mixed yeah, in it was a piece of vertebrae. Uh, Back. Yeah, but but the pro the problem is you have the femur would it's a very very small, but here here with the the socket for the femur, so they would all fit in. The, this this kind of fits in with everything else. So it basically uh, it it would be and and the thing is this it the other pelvis I show you was small <clears throat> for a human female, for a human female to be this it it have to be hobbit size. You know, so basically, you're talking about, you know, really small people. If if it was, and then how, and but, uh, but that's what Lucy was a hobbit size creature. I think it was only a meter, a meter or so tall or whatever. Yeah. And but the thing is, this isn't um, basically. I it's not really. It it looks more human like, but it's not a human like pelvis. It's not a human pelvis either. Uh, where did I? Put the, here it is. Sorry, here. If you if you look here, if I put these together, what you find is that even though it's much smaller, the Lucy pelvis, according to this one, is actually wider than than the hip, the human pelvis, the white one, which means that it's these ilia blades, the ilium, are flaring sideways a lot more than the human pelvis. And this one is described as the upper ilia flaring. So this one is quite wide for its size. Uh, whereas the, 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 where, but even this small pelvis is wider. So that, so generally this is described as, as having ilia, which are laterally flaring. And so that, so that kind of puts the, I guess the muscles in a slightly, that are attached to it, a slightly different position, angles, whatever. Which it affects its posture, its movement, and things like that. But the other thing you notice, I think I noticed, I was looking at yesterday, is if you compare the the top here, this is the base or the body. Uh, I'll show you that point to the, the body here, that area here, uh, and I, and you can see here, this is the same in the in the human here. 
that's where the um, the bottom of the, the spine, the lumbar region, it attaches to to um, it, it attaches, and, and the sacrum basically attaches the the load gets the load of the the upper body, the spine, and and, and basically attaches the pelvic girdle to it through the sacroiliac joints here in this region here. But the thing is, you notice the, this is very small. This area is very small. Even if you scale it to that one, it would still be very small. And that tells me that if it was an obliged biped, if it, if it, if it was always walking in twos, then um, it wasn't. It doesn't seem like it would be because you'd expect that that it um, be bigger because it'd be having to bear such a lot of weight load, and and because the lumbar vertebrae in humans are quite are very large larger than the top ones because they've got to bear the weight of the body if, when you, if you're walking all twos so this tells me that the, the well, weight it wasn't bearing such a strong weight uh, as as say a, a normal human would and so so it tell so it would i don't think it was um an obligatory biped that means it walked around at all times on twos, it may have been an optional biped, but what else is optionally biped? Ex 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 existing apes, gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, gibbons all, can all also walk bipedally optionally. That's so now some are more efficient at it than others. So it's sort of like, um, because like with, um, you know, chimps can climb trees. Orangutans are mainly dwell in the trees. They walk bipedally on branches, mainly small branches. But they use assisted bipedalism means they use they put a hand overhead, grab a branch, and they may gra grab for something to eat or something. But they can walk bipedally, mainly on smaller branches, uh, and grab a branch overhead to support their weight. Gibbons are, if if uh, evolutionists were looking for the ants, the the most the a common ancestor, which was bipedal, which um, most the most bipedal, they'd be looking at gibbons, because basically they're the most uh, they have the best body adapted for uh, bipedalism of the existing apes. They're the lesser ape, but they uh, studies have shown they walk more bipedally than any of the than chimps, gorillas, orangutans, and uh, but they're mainly in the trees, but they walk on branches and trees bipedally walk around. If they're forced to the ground, they'll run bipedally. So basically, bipedalism isn't. It, it they make evolutionists are sort of they 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 say well the first stage of becoming an ape man hominid was you started to walk upright, and I think a lot of in the creation movement have reacted to this and basically bipedalism has become a dirty word almost you know so but in, it, so so you don't say it uh, you, but what's come out now is. If you look at um, the apes in Europe, they're finding the apes that, that supposedly in the evolutionary timeline existed millions of years before any of the Australopithecines, or any of these ape men, apes that weren't no, that no one, I don't, well, very few would consider ape men. They have adapt, adaptations for bipedalism. They could work probably like Lucy did, but they were they were designed to live in trees, but they could also walk. Upright, probably like a like, like orangutan assisted by pedalism, but they. And the latest one was, for example, um, I just got a written written down here if I can find the thing. Yeah. So you have so you basically um, Danimus gugun moss, and you had all, also Oreopithecus bambuli, and you also had uh, Rudopithecus. But, that, but basically, um, so they could walk walk in a tree by pedal leap. And if, if you can walk on a branch in a tree, if you did go to the ground, you know, you, you're you likely to be able to walk on the ground too if you can walk on branches in the trees. But the thing is, what that what that what this shows is if the apes that were, uh, I, get, I wouldn't call an obligatory by pedal, but optionally by pedal leap, um, millions of years ago, and they were probably likely better than chimps are today because gibbons are better bipedalists than chimps are today. So God designed, you know, he, there's a lot of extinct apes. So God, you know, you got two legs. God's, you know, that's usually for walking. So God 
gave like, all these creatures various abilities to walk on twos and, and a lot of them, you know, walk on fours, but they can also walk on twos and they can uh, climb trees and stuff like that. But the the catch is um, if apes millions of years supposedly before the Australopithecines were walking on two legs, what makes Australopithecines special if they walked on two legs? So I say, so what? If they if Australopithecines walked on two legs, they were more bipedal than, than chimps, uh, which probably Lucy was. Then I say, so what? What does that prove? That the in your in your own timeline, they were doing that millions of years ago, and you don't call them ape men. So why does that make these things ape men? So that kind of nullifies the argument. It just it, because because you 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 you're not applying it equally. The fit and the thing is with bipedal is there's a lot of there's a lot of factors that go into this, and and they say it evolved independently, but evolving all these features. Uh, to create bipedalism from a, a creature that walked only on four fours. It, again, we have the waiting time problem. How, it will take how long, you know, forever. But to do it independently, it becomes impossibly impossible, even more so. So um, that's the way it kind of I, I look at this, this whole area. And I, I think it's sort of been too, too defensive. We've taken a too much defensive approach. And you got to be a bit more offensive. And say, well, well, what about these apes? Millions, supposedly millions of years ago, they were bipedal. Why aren't these? Why aren't you calling these ape men? But you say these ape men. It's sort of that's sort of being a bit selective, isn't it? And and the thing is, Lucy. If you look at Lucy's, so so we just looked at the pelvis, but look at other Lucy's other features. So it, his leg was short, so that indicates, and his feet. <laughs> if you look at her feet. Um, they were sort of apish, long, long, long sort of fingers and things like that. And even though they try to twist it, it seems to indicate by um, that, that I think, what, what, what's the name of that Lucy's child? Uh, I don't want to get it, spell it wrong, but uh, the, uh, the, the, the Lucy's, they find, they, they find a child of Lucy. Um, the Kika um, child? Yeah, yeah. It, it it indicated it's that that toe. its big toe, big it big's toe was divergent from the other toes, which would indicate that it was pedal grasping. It was grasping, which means that's the best indicator that Lucy was also had a divergent big toe, which means it was for grasping branches. So it, so basically, with short legs and apish sort of feet for grasping, an upper body for climbing. Lucy would have likely, if mostly designed, probably bipedal to walk on branches and trees and stuff like that, and it wouldn't have been very good at any. Wouldn't have been good at running bipedally. It could, I believe, walk bipedally like like James Gibbons do. I don't know if it was a, as efficient as Gibbs as existing Gibbons, but maybe. But you know, so what? I mean, I mean, it's not. It doesn't prove anything. In my book, it, it proves nothing because you already have you, you have a, you have existing I, I, sorry extinct apes millions of years ago that did the same thing, and you're not calling them ape men. So why are these ape men? Uh, a couple of things. One, uh, there are other uh, uh, creatures on Earth that are bipedal, uh, including extinct animals that, that that have been you know in the fossil uh, that, that's been bipedal, like uh, theropod dinosaurs were bipedal. Um, you know, like T Rex and and so forth, and uh, uh, birds are bipedal and so forth. So bipedal has nothing to do with whether or not if they're related to us or or whatnot. Now, so uh, my my position is from a young Earth perspective. I'm open to the idea of whether it's bipedal or not bipedal. I I I, I don't like say no. It cannot be bipedal no matter what because I know no matter how the chips fall, it's not going to prove evolution regardless. Um, yeah. but, uh, uh, so for me, it's just simply a matter of the data. You know, if, if, if Lucy yeah, was bipedal, yeah, exactly. I gotta look at the data and see whether Lucy is exactly. bipedal or not. Uh, could, and the second thing I was going to uh, tell you, could you hold up the, um, the, uh, Lucy's pelvis, pelvis again that you held up a minute ago? Yep. Yep. All right. Uh, some people suggest that because it is bowl shaped. That that means that it walked upright, um, and I know that you specialize in an anatomy and so forth. Does that have anything to do with uh, uh, whether it walked on two legs or not? 
Well, well, actually, actually probably this is, the the human one is probably more bowl shaped. That's that's kind of more bowl shaped. It's more so you get and the inlet there is more circular than than the Lucy one. That's not really circular. This is circular. So the, I'd say the human one is more bowl shaped. The thing with the Lucy one is more. It, it's it's uh, if it's a bowl, it's, it's more as like a dinner plate shape because it's sort of flattish, more flattish. You know, it's, it's not it's not that it doesn't curve up to the size much like the human ones. It's more flaring out, so that <clears throat> that means it it doesn't curve around to the size more. So that so that wouldn't have the same the muscles wouldn't um, probably give the same support for bipedalism as it would in a human. And um, you, you know, I don't even know how the how well this is reconstructed. This is this is from a bone clones. I mean, they do good jobs and stuff like that, but ultimately they're relying on casts from others. And I don't know. You can see here the the joint here that's missing, and and apparently, I think this joint here was uh, in the original is really crushed so you'd have to reconstruct it and 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 the people who did that they would probably make you know if they're looking for an ape man they're not going to make it look like an ape <laughs> so they're going to try to humanize whatever so i don't so i don't fully trust the reconstruction so so this could be well be even more flaring than uh you mentioned this something is. Yeah. sorry i found your uh it's interesting what what you said a while ago that the the if this was a bipedal ape, then or then it put too much pressure or something like that on. Uh, yeah, well, well, the thing is that this is this. If you're bipedal and you stand upright, then all the weight comes on this point here, and usually that's why it, it, that's why you get back problems because because all the weight comes in. But the, this body here bears sure most of the weight. The so 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 in apes it wouldn't be that. In fact, in fact, in a chimp. It's quite large. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly why. If you have a chimp pelvis, see, it's very big. That body is very big, but it, but it, it doesn't bear the same amount of weight. So I, I'm not sure why, but but it's very narrow. So the sacrum is different in Lucy and the chimp. So but but the thing is this this here which bears the weight, the body is not very important. If you if you scaled it up to the human one. And I kind of did some. I tried to roughly measure it last night. This, this is, this would not scale up proportionally. See, it's, it's almost as broad as it's not as big as the human, but it's, the sacrum is quite broad, almost almost as broad as the human one. But this body is not in the. In, it's not very. It's not very big. So, it, so it means it probably didn't. It didn't. Uh, if, if it if it supported everything upright, if it was walking around like that all the time, the, the lumbar region would probably be thicker. Because it's got to support the weight, and you expect that to, that meets the the lower lumbar region, so that would probably be bigger to support the weight. So that indicates me it probably wasn't bearing the weight all the time on it, and and that sort of it. so so that's why I don't think it was an obligatory. It wasn't compulsory bipedal. It was an optional. And the thing is, <clears throat> this, you, while people bipedal is a loaded word, no no one because you got you can get onto it. No one can say that. Chimps weren't optionally bipedal because you can get videos seeing chimps walk on two legs. Same with gorillas, same with orangutans. But they walk mainly walk like like uh, gorillas and chimps walk on on their knuckles. Orang orangutans they'll walk you know on the fours. Orangutans will walk on their not not they don't, they're not knuckle walkers. They'll walk on their palms and and fists on the ground. But they'll also walk on two legs, but not not that often. Gibbons they'll walk. Of all these apes, Gibbons walked the most bipedal, bipedal, and so it's not a question of they weren't, if or not, uh, they they all were bipedal to some degree. It's just how were they built for it? Some weren't that well built for it, awkward, you know. So so they basically the the like in the chimps, the the angle of the femur go from the this hip socket goes straight downwards. And so it doesn't it doesn't go in more inwards like it does in humans, and so, and and it's kind of built quite awkwardly for bipedalism. So that's why you know it doesn't we would it's it's not really designed for it, but it can still walk on two legs. So so 
<clears throat> so really, it's it's it ha it's it's more optional bipedalism rather than non bipedalism. Unless and and I don't, I don't know of anyone who's going to say that that these creatures can't walk on two legs because they can, but it's very awkwardly and it's not their preferred way, and that's the way I look at it. So when, when people, it, it's 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 sort of the bipedalism that is a controversial thing is the obligatory that oh they always walked on two legs they had to walk on two legs that's the story. No, I don't believe Lucy was obligatory. Humans. Humans are probably the only ones I know of that are obligatory by people that we we don't uh, walk we we don't walk on all fours and we walk very comfortably on, on twos. We're the only ones adapted for running. We and in fact the uh, <coughs> excuse me the, we don't um, a lot a lot of the thing about Lucy's feet and and walking too late it, it's actually um, obtained from the uh, you're going to get to it later, but I'll, I might as well get to it. The Laotoli footprints, the fossilized footprint from from Tanzania, which allegedly date around 3.6 million years ago. Okay, now that where where they say Lucy may have had a you know a medial longitudinal arch sort of in the foot like humans, or or the toe, the big toe is aligned with the other toes. It Just comes the, from the, it comes from these footprints. Since we're noting this point. Uh... Lucy actually didn't have any feet with the fossils, correct? Sorry, there's no feet with the fossils. Uh, well, 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 no, no, not Lucy, but Af Af there, there was, there are fossil uh, bones of other other members of Afarensis. So Lucy belonged to Australopithecus Afarensis, and so there are other Afarensis specimens that have fossil feet, but you, but they're not. Uh, there's no fully articulated foot, so they. They put a foot together from different parts of different members, but there's no there's no conclusive evidence of that. Basically, that Lucy was uh, or, or, or that Afarensis had a a big toe aligned with the other toes. It, it seems even with the, the 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 juvenile, which seemed to have a a a ducted big toe, that it was actually you know in that direct like that, not like that. And so basically, they didn't get a full grasp. But now, what the what they did, I've got a thing. Here, this is from Scientific American, but it it shows you the, these are the um, these are the kind of the the footprints here, if you can see, of the Lotola footprints. I believe that site. Um, now, what what happens is that, so they, they even even uh, even an expert evolutionist. Uh, I'll quote you here about these footprints. We, evolutionists, many of them say they were made by by Lucy's kind, Australopithecus afarensis. But an expert, Russell Tuttle, Russell Tuttle, he I quote, he says the 3.66 million years ago footprint trails at Latol in Tanzania are the earliest definite evidence for obligate hominid bipedalism. That is, they 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 had to walk on two legs. In all observable features of foot shape and walk patterns. The three creatures that made the trails on their, their site G are indistingu indistinguishable from modern habitually barefoot human beings walking at a leisurely pace. Basically, these are indistingu indistinguishable from human footprints. Now, if you want the most parsimonious or simple explanation, is they were human. Now, if the date, if if there was a date of say instead of three point six, say they were at a million years. Then guess what? Evolution would say that's un that's evidence that they were human, but because of a date, they can't have it because the whole evolutionary narrative would actually collapse. If if they were humans there, then all the ideas that sort of um, you know Homo erectus evolved about two million years ago and all this stuff would collapse. So they can't have it as human. But what what is interesting? So they, so they say they like these footprints are made by afarensis, but even evolutionary experts are saying that these are too modern, they're too human-like to be afarensis. And but what, um, I'm probably going to talk, sound a bit like talking, um, someone from Jurassic Park, we're talking about site A's and G's, and but there is actually another site. So there's site G and site S. Those were footprints of humans, I believe. But there's another a Lyotoli site called Site A, 
which sort of went into the obscurity because I didn't know what to do with them. But lately they come out and I can show you here. You can see here. So you can see, I don't know, this, see this footprint, see this here? Does that look like a human footprint? So that's a human footprint. This is uh, site G, I believe. That's from site A. And you can see there's a divergent toe there. See, the toe sticks out. Now, that's not made by a human, okay? So that, so, so now, now they're, they're believing that so these guys say that there must have been two hominids or two ape men living there because this isn't human yet. But what, what I'm suggesting is, because <clears throat> I'm, not, I'm not bound by these dates, the site GNS, they were humans, and you had some that were small. It's like a family walking almost. It probably was. That's the most simple explanation. The one on the right, the side A, that was probably a footprint from uh, Lucy's kind, Australopithecus afarensis, with the divergent toe. And that's probably where, you know, if it was optionally bipedally, it could have still walked around a little bit on its, uh, it, would, it would have, if it was on the ground, maybe it walked around a little bit and that created those footprints. And so you have, so that's, so basically you have evidence, humans and Australopithecines living together at the same time period at a time when humans supposedly didn't exist. So that's my interpretation uh, of it. Uh, and there's another uh, interesting fossil that, um, in terms of the Australopithecines, they found um, a fossil uh, that they assigned to Australopithecus afarensis called Cadenamu, or Big Man, as I put it, they call it. It's, its scientific name is KSDVP111. Now, this, yeah, I've heard they found of a skeleton. Man. Sorry? I've heard of Big Man. Yeah, yeah. So they found that skeleton in, 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 in sort of Ethiopia. Uh, you know, but it, it was kind of missing crucial bits like the like the head and whatever. But it, but because it was dated three point six million years ago, around that or, or around roughly, I think it was a, yeah. Again, it they couldn't. It, it had to be Australopithecus afarensis because the theory dictates it. You can't. But it, or not pretty much in all aspects. Aspects. It's it's like a Homo erectus skeleton. Like a. It's like finding a Tucanoboy there or something like that. But but because of that, because of because of their um, allegiance to the evolutionary timeline, and they dated it. Um, basically, they assigned it to um, uh, Afarensis. No, but but I believe it, it has the you know the, the longer legs and and things like that, um, which would uh, make it uh, a human. And but but they're not going to ever acknowledge that. And so, but that sort of. Um, uh, well, it started to yeah. Would you say that Big Man is a human? Is that what you're saying? That it's human? Yeah, or... yeah. I believe well, it's it's Homo erectus, and we haven't gotten to that, but but the Homo erectus were definitely human, and so it probably was a Homo erectus type robust human, and and so that was a human, but they 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 cannot acknowledge that because I don't believe Homo erectus existed then. So so again, um, because of the the dating thing, um, they kind of. Um, uh, assigned references and even even a lot of dates. So it's a lot of his stuff in Africa. They're dated by volcanic tuff and material. This gives them millions of years or whatever. But remember um, that they've died, if you if you really believe in his dating, remember that they've dated volcanic lava and stuff in historical times in the last fifty hundred years. So you know it was only fifty hundred years old. That that still give millions of years or hundreds of thousands of years. The, using potassium argon or whatever. So basically, you can get so so if if dates of historical uh, volcano volcanic material are wrong, give these same sort of ages. How do you know these? When you how do you know these ages were correct? That's my, my question. My understanding is you can only really date the ash to begin with. So it yeah. even dating the ash that doesn't really date the prints really. Um, no, but but, but it, because it because they're between ash layers, they kind of that's how they do it. You know, they they assume it's between the ash layers, so there's one on the top, one on the bottom, so the date had to be somewhere between those two. But but the, what I'm saying is the ash layers are wrong. The ash layer, if if volcanic material in in the present is dated to to those sort of ages, how do you know that those ages are correct? Yeah, because they, I did, I, 
Yeah. So that's so. we're not going to get too much into dating material, but yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Uh, I know that uh, uh, that the right team have done studies on this, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. uh, different vol uh, volcano eruptions that they know the dates of. Um, yeah. So, uh, uh, but we're not going to cover that right now. But I do find that their argument is a bit circular. They assume that man didn't exist at the time of uh, Australopithecines, and then. And then they say, well, this is dated to the time of Australopithecines, therefore a human being couldn't make it. So it yeah. just kind of assumes it, the position. Yeah, it, it, it's sort of, it's circular reasoning. Yeah. It, it's a bit like a, I, with the Homo erectus skulls, um, that, that, you know, uh, okay, here's, here's a Peking man, Homo erectus skull, just, just to show so people know what I'm talking about. Okay. Now, this is, this is a composite, by the way. These, most of those were actually lost in World War II, but, but they would make good casts of them. But the thing is, Homo erectus, they, they usually uh, say they're, they're small brain species, and, and there are many Homo erectus specimens with small brains. But, but the thing is, if you get <coughs> a Homo erectus type specimen with the, the robust features, the brow ridges, the super orbital torus at the back sticking out, low fled um, skull, and whatever, if you and the, but they have a large brain capacity or cranial capacity, then then what they say is well, um, it can't be erectus because because erectus didn't have large brains, so we'll assign it to something different. And but again, that's circular reasoning because of course you end up with a small brain species if you exclude anything with large brains. So it's, it's circular reasoning. So you kind of so it's easy to prove they had small brains if if you take out anything. <laughs> that had large brains. So, so for so, di, so for instance, I, I don't have um. I have, this is the um. The known as Rhodesia man or Cabo skull. So that looks like quite robust. So that used to be Homo. They used to classify this as Homo erectus, but now it's put in our Homo heidelbergensis category. It's got a brain capacity of 1300 cc. So that's you know well within the, the modern range. Uh, the, the modern human average is about uh, 1,345 cubic centimeters. It's a very robust skull, but but so it's now classified as Homo heidelbergensis. So so that so then I can say, well, there are no uh, big brain Homo erectus specimens. In fact, they uh, one interesting in, in recent years I found one in, in Suchang, China. It had <coughs> erectus features, but Again, it had a large brain. In fact, it had one of the largest brains ever recorded in the fossil record, about 1,800 cubic centimetres, which is about as large as any Neanderthal. And again, um, it wasn't classified as Homo erectus because it, because it didn't fit the narrative of Homo erectus being small brain. So so people people that look, so the funny erectus skulls will have big brow ridges. But just remember, there are large specimens with large brow ridges too, but they don't classify them as Homo erectus because of this. And, and so <clears throat> being robust or having all these robust features is not an in indicative of actually cranial capacity. And But, e but as, um, as a, if, I don't know if I get around to it, but even, even cranial capacity doesn't mean much in terms of intelligence, but in terms of uh, there's, there's not really much link between brain size and intelligence, which is a big problem for evolution, but we'll get to that maybe if, if we'll see how well, we some go. Some people, like, like paleontologists and find dinosaurs uh, with small brains like triceratops or something like that, and they just kind of just assume that that, that they are lacking intelligence because of the, the size of their craniums. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, I would like to, I wanted to ask you about the um, you mentioned earlier about the the foot of uh, the Kikatau, and yeah. I heard uh, or I read that the that that was found in a rock some distance away. Is that true? In what sorry, found what? Rock, uh, the Kikatau's foot. I found in a rock some distance away. I to be honest, I, that it's it's one specimen. I'm not I'm not entirely sure, but I, all I know is that 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 from from the latest report is that. That the um, the foot indicates that it had a divergent big toe, and was and could have been used for grasping. So that was ape-like foot. So to to me, it's not a to me, it's sort of clearly apish and indicates that Afarensis was ape, very apish. So you, uh, you, you think know. it's wrong when someone suggests because I've actually heard evolutionists 
put the Kika child into that category. Like, oh, uh, well, we also have the Kika child as if they have a um, um, foot like that. Um, but what, yeah, but all, all, I, all I've read is recently someone who's a foot expert is, is saying it, it, it the the um, the foot was actually well the, basically the the it had a divergent big toe. It means it was used for grasping in the child, and uh, they fear as maybe when it grows up it gets less divergent or something like that. But so 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 to me it's a kind of a non-issue. It just proves that Australopithecines were apish, although like I said, an extinct apish group. But they didn't have feet like humans or any, anything like that, and so 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 uh, yeah, I haven't really looked too much into that because it's kind of it, it's a non-issue. It, it doesn't it doesn't raise any difficulties whatsoever. In a little bit, we're not going to do it right in a second because I want to try to get through my notes here. Um, but yeah. um, uh, here in a little bit, we're going to talk about Prometheus, and and we'll we'll uh, yeah. uh, talk about that because that there's a lot of controversy involving the foot on uh, Prometheus. Yeah. So, um, I can talk about that if you, I can I, I can talk about that if you want the Prometheus foot. You want to talk about that now or wait? All right. Um you, you wanted to talk about Prometheus. Yeah, um uh there's a lot of controversy. I mean, if you look at the, the rest of Australopithecine Prometheus, I mean it looks very primate other than you know its height. You know, um it's it's obviously big. Um, and it's it's actually the most complete uh fossil that they have of Australopithecines, and it just happens to it includes a foot, and so there's a lot of controversy surrounding that foot. And you got some information on that? Yeah, I, actually, I, I the only controversy is that is, is what I call uh revisionist morphology, or when when the the foot the foot bones, some of the foot bones that get information on it. <clears throat> We actually found in a box, and that's how they discovered the, the fossil. It was actually a Ronald Clark looking through some boxes, found some bones, and then um, they looked foot bones, and then they could identify where they came from, and that's how they found the rest of the skeleton. So it's it sort of, I think it's frozen, articulated in, in rock or breccia. So it's, it's an articulate skeleton, and it's, yeah, it's a, I think it's a very typical job. Australopithecus is an IP skeleton. But the thing is, that, notice how that's how they, I've got a picture in my book about how that, that was the, that's how they made the, the, the uh, foot bone is actually like that. You can see the big toe is actually sticking out. That's how, that's how they originally did it. Um, that's how they envisioned, okay, yeah, that's how they actually envisioned it. So basically, again, it was divergent. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I believe the Australopithecines were. They had a divergent big toe. Their foot was used, used for grasping apish. That's pretty much the end of the story. But revision in recent times, because that because it doesn't suit the evolutionary narrative, they try to now make it sort of like it was in line with the big toes. Mm -hmm. But if it, so, so, so that, that's what I said. Uh, there was a guy who said fossils are fickle. You can make them sing any song they want. And this is the tune they're singing out. So you know, I I tend to go of the original because I think they were probably less less biased if that can be said then than now, where they're trying to really push these this stuff on you. So uh, the funny I, thing I, is, uh, <laughs> originally, uh, um, uh, and I think you might have even cited this as well. Uh, Clark recognized the fact that it is uh, that the um, uh, the big toe. Was in the fact divergent and that like an apes, uh, yeah. you know, divergent. But yes. uh, the rest, but then he he argued for the rest of the foot being transitional. Now it's like the opposite among everyone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. for the you know, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, it, yeah, it's 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 just uh, that that's what I said. Like like Oxnard analyzed, well, not this one, but other things. have found that a lot of these things were both different from apes and humans. So the thing is, yeah, they might the the foot bones may have had some difference in it because they weren't apes or human; they were a different group altogether. And so that's kind of, uh, and so sometimes, sometimes yeah, they weren't. They didn't necessarily have a chimpanzee foot, but they didn't have a human foot either. And so, uh, yeah. But there was but, a foot of primate. Yeah, a foot of primate. Yeah. Um, uh, 
some people say that uh, it had a inline big toe, but that's uh, false. It, it didn't actually have an inline big toe. So well, that's the just, that's the revisionist history. That right. revision of morphology, I mean, me, that they yeah, go I'll back and say, well, actually, no, it's it, because that suits our narrative better. So, then, so we know. So, but you know, um, the thing is, you're still looking at the same bones. Right. So, so and they're claiming that the uh, same bones uh, have different yeah. interpretations, and but they're they're very, you know, they they the how they how how they their uh, philosophy on it really will bias your interpretation. You could say. With divergency, it, it, it's either divergent or it's not, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And, and sometimes people say, "Well, it's uh, uh, intermediate," because I guess it's not as yeah. divergent as, as some others. And it's like, "Well, yeah. no, uh, it, it's it, yeah. divergent. It doesn't matter. I mean, it, it might be a, like you said, a different primate, but it's yeah. still yeah. it's still divergent." And, I, and the thing <laughs> is, God created uh, there was a, a lot of different primates, a lot of existing primates today, apes, but a lot of Gibbons, a lot of monkeys, and there were in the past. There's a lot of, in the fossils in Europe. There's a lot of extinct apes, and the Australopithecines were extinct primates too. A lot of, lot of, a lot of variation. God created, you know, an initial, certainly a lot of initial variation, and that diversified. So, so it makes it sometimes hard to sort of, to, to, to group them. You know, what what is it? Which should, which, which people do I belong to one or be local kinds? It's hard to, hard to know, but. But yeah, right. Um, uh, yeah, that. The, um, uh, so you would say that the uh, the foot uh, permit. Oh, another thing I was going to bring up to you on Prometheus is that uh, the original discoverer of Prometheus claimed that it's a new species altogether. That's why he called it uh, uh, Australopithecus uh, Prometheus. But some people still suggest that it's a um, uh, Australopithecus Africanus. Um, yeah. I think because of some similarities in the arm and yeah. uh, where the head, those, those, he says, no, the head's too distinct from Australopithecus uh, Africanus. Uh, so, what would you say on that? Well, I think what, what he's done is I've taken some specimen from Africanus and put him into Prometheus with this new specimen. So, it's not just this specimen, but others that I put in there to create a Australopithecus Prometheus, but that name was, it was actually already taken by some other fossil there called Australopithecus Prometheus. So it's sort of, the name existed, but it was, uh, anyhow, I, I'm not that up to date with the history of it, but anyhow, I use that name, but I, I believe that the Africanus and Prometheus fossils were, they, they belonged to the same biblical kind. Now, they, they probably had differences a bit Bit like you know, there's there's Indian and African elephants, but they're probably the same same biblical kind, and and you have so differences that emerge out, you know, diversify. If you have a lot of um, genetic variation, then the, these uh, differences can occur uh, quite well, rapidly. Uh, similarity and uh, differences in yeah, the yeah, story. yeah. And if there's a lot, of, you mean that could occur very quickly because if if you know, so so, but I. I yeah, but I, I suspect that they were the one, and, and some evolution believe that, and and they also some even even the other one there, the the Australopithecus, the Deba found my burger. Some believe that was just a, a variation of Africanus. You think that um, that Prometheus was uh, some some degree chimeric, where there was some things that were African or not chimeric, a similarity to to. Uh, uh, Australopithecus Africanus, but yet clearly distinct in terms of uh, well, 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 I think I think that it's not just from there, it was this very, very, this, this just variation within that Africanus, and that's why that's why Clark took some other specimen from Africanus and put them with Prometheus because they looked more like Prometheus that he that he thinks of Prometheus, but others think it's more. That, that Africanus is just one big uh, species, and that the variation in Prometheus can be absorbed within um, um, uh, Afri Africanus. I don't, I don't, you know, it's, it's not, it's not a, yeah, yes, in that sense. But uh, cer certainly, the skeleton of Prometheus, uh, you know, uh, it's sort of there's no, there's, there's no sort of nothing commingle anything like that. The, the only question is what they put in the boxes. Um, 
whether anything got mixed up, any other stuff got mixed up in those boxes. That's the only question, but uh, but but generally, yeah. Uh, hey, what is the uh, hoopla with uh, Lucy? Uh, I know that we talked about Prometheus already, and that's the most complete fossil, um, and it was found sometime after Lucy. But uh, Lucy, when it was found, I think it was the most complete of the Australopithecines found at that time. And um, my understanding is that I wish to say that about 40% of the um, uh, fossil was found. Um, I think some people said, suggest less than that, actually. Uh, the 40%, uh, Dr. Bergman said that it's just like, like if you find one femur, you consume the mirror version of yeah, yeah. that, even though it's missing. Yep. Um, and so they just kind of calculate up to like 40%. But he, he said that if you really consider what actually got found, it's about closer to like uh 20%, 22%, somewhere on there. Um, and so uh uh what is the the controversy surrounding Lucy? Um I think we already discussed some of the yeah, the, I think, I think it's, it, it, it's the controversy is, is entirely about the uh but mostly did, did she walk the what was she a obligatory biped or not? And um, it, 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 and, that, and, and what was a you know like like um how, you know, basically how did she walk by bipedally like 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 she you know I believe she was by bi bipedal but I don't believe she was a obligatory biped bipedalist like like a, that was her only choice it, it was more by by optional a bit like extent apes are optional maybe. Maybe she probably decide more efficient. The guy decided more efficient than say uh, chimpanzees. Whether it's more efficient than gibbons, I don't know. But she was more for the life in the trees, walking in the trees, branches, and and they can walk like orangutans and gibbons walk on branches of trees on on a bipedally using a using assisted you know uh, using assisted bipedalism using holding a overhead branch for support and then. Grabbing fruit or whatever, so it's sort of. I think that's what the main mechanism was because if you, if you look at where <coughs> supposed to Lucy live on the African savanna or whatever it was, that the, the amount of predators there. If you if you lived on the ground, you you would it'd be uh, you wouldn't live very long and be fodder for for all these big cats and stuff. You wouldn't survive it. So so she had she, if she didn't live in trees, she wouldn't live at all. Um, that's certainly my belief. So she had to be designed for living trees, and 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 of course, if you can walk on branches of trees, you can probably walk on the ground too, and, right. and that's what probably happened a bit like. And as as can existing apes, and, and people need to understand that. And it's no big deal. Like I said, they found European apes that were bipedal in the same in the same manner like Lucy. So uh, not not entirely the same, but but so if they're not. Ape men because of that. Why should the Australopithecus be? That this is this is a it's because you know it, it, there's a lot of you know the the belief in evolution is what drives all this thing. There's no don't think there's anyone in that camp, and I don't pretend to be objective either. But there's no one in that camp who's objective about it. There's no one who's objective about this sort of stuff in a sense that would be open to any idea of intelligent design or anything like that. And in fact, no one is even open to intelligent design of the genome or anything like that. And and the human brain, almost inf infinite functional complexity with nanomachines and all. The most, and the mind isn't even physical. We don't even know the mind. Your, your thoughts, your thoughts aren't even. You can't explain that by any laws of physics. Yeah, evolution yeah. Had trouble. And, 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 and but, but yet yet you know it evolved. How does something non physical evolve with something that is physical? How do, how does that tag onto the gene? Do you, you know, you know, when the genes combine or whatever, how does that get inherited? I mean, this is the whole. The, 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 you know, the, the, I, I'm glad I don't believe in evolution because boy, I would have be having I would be having real doubts about my faith if that was my belief because it's just uh, endless questions of worries about you know you have to be, everything happened by chance and if there's one supernatural event that destroys the whole materialistic view of life doesn't it hey uh dr Lyle, i want to ask you about uh Tompkins brought up um in uh, uh our interview about uh, some papers that have been written on this uh on uh 
because there are some evolutionists that have even said that they thought that uh, Lucy uh, walked uh, quad, uh, quadrupedic uh, like an ape, you know, a knuckle walker, yeah. uh, and in trees and things like that. And one of the evidence that was given is um, a kind of like a, a locking mechanism in the wrist, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, now, of course, the hands wouldn't include it with Lucy, but I think if I'm not mistaken, they're getting that from other Afrensis. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah. I read, I read that. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know, I don't know which specimen the. I read the story about the locking mechanism in an Afrensis specimen. I don't know what which specimen it was, and the thing is, <clears throat> it you you can walk it, the idea with walking on all fours and walking in twos. It doesn't have to be an either or all thing, like. Chimps walk on fours, they walk optionally on twos, and they walk in a tree. So it doesn't have to be if you do if you if you walk knuckle walk, that's all you can do. You know? Well, you know that, <laughs> so, so Lucy may well and knuckle walk, but she may have been able to walk on twos as well. Chimps can, gorillas can. Uh so why why couldn't Lucy do that? You know, right. so so that's so 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 so, so um, it doesn't have to be an either or thing, you know, it, it can be both. Well, that's my, I was going to ask uh, the only uh, um, the locking me mechanism. Would that indicate a uh, knuckle walker? And by that, I don't necessarily mean bipedal versus quadrupedal. I mean someone that normally walked on their knuckles. Because I mean, human beings, you know, if we if I try yeah. to walk on my knuckles for any length of time, it's going to hurt. Uh, obviously, uh, the hands of a a primate is actually designed to be able to walk on their knuckles. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, the 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 question I have is, well, one, does that Francis have that that locking mechanism, and two, does the locking mechanism uh, have anything to do with them being knuckle walkers? Well, I think I think from memory, I, I, I'm not a hammer with it. I think the the mechanism was in that. In the radius bone of the arm, I'm here. So, so locking onto the wrist. So that's where the locking is. So, because the wrist is quite flexible, so there's a way of lock. If you can lock the wrist, it will make it easier to walk on knuckles. If this this doesn't bend around like that, so so yeah. If that if you can lock the wrist up, that would indicate that you're you're probably using it for something like that. So that could that could indicate knuckle walking. Yeah. I'm so I'm not. You know that. Like I said. I don't think it has to be either or, because you you know, chimps although they walk awkwardly in twos, they can still walk on twos even though they're knuckle walkers. Uh, and and I I don't know the ratio of how well Lucy walked on twos, and how well she walked on fours, how well she climbed in trees. You know, I think God created a lot a lot of diversity. You know, and and so we just we're just not sure. But I don't know if it's a totally uh, you know the, the locking mechanism. You know, it, I don't think that it's a hundred percent certain because it, you you can't really be a hundred percent certain or something like that. But but it could it certainly it certainly indicates that. But yeah. All right. Um, all right. Um, uh, I heard that there's evidence of of Lucy dying by falling out of a tree. Have you heard that? Yeah, I've heard she that she. Well, yeah, that they found a. Uh, um, that the bone that somehow there was that she fell on the was it arm bones or something and and broke something and things like that yeah so she fell off a tree or something like that I I don't know where I don't know whether like you could actually tell that from the thing but but I think there's plenty of other evidence that indicate she was Lucy or the Atherensis um, species was built to climb in trees and and that, that you know because of their the structure so you know that's that's poor that's that's plausible but I, I don't know whether that actually is true or not because because you, you're just looking at some fossils and how, what happened to them you know they could have poor you know that could have been dead and a hippo stood on us so <laughs> broke the thing so you so you just don't know what what actually happened uh how the how how the the specimen actually died so so, I mean, it's possible, but I, I wouldn't be certain. I'm going to skip over mm -hmm. questions five, six, and seven because uh, we've already dealt with a lot of this. Um, sure, sure. And uh, so I'm going to uh, push forward to question eight, which is what about uh, Australopithecus africanus? 
Uh, yeah. you kind of hinted at that a little bit earlier, and 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 we discussed it just slightly. But um, could you tell me about that particular specimen? Yeah. Uh, so this is a this isn't a scarlet Miss, Mrs. Players uh, uh, basically uh, um, discovered by uh, I think it was by uh, by Broom and um, Robinson in South Africa in uh, what year was it 1947. So that's an Australopithecus cranium here, okay. It does so look pregnancy. different from Prometheus. Sorry, is right. Uh, Clark said that the skull of the Prometheus looked very different from Alphaconus, uh, and he it does look different from Alpha. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. Although we don't we don't really have a we don't really have a cast of it, so it's so hard to say. But 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 the thing is that this this is a the sort of is that the actual fossil. So, so, sorry. Is that an actual fossil? Yeah, well, it's, it's a cast of the actual fossil. Yeah. Okay. So, so, <clears throat> but you can see the prognathic here and the, the large face and stuff like that. So that's the Africanus, and so they, they from, from what evolutionists say, they they kind of was the post cranially others. They were not that different from Afarensis post cranially. They they were a, a little bit more. The skulls may have been a little bit different in um, Africanus compared to Afarensis. I don't know whether you're just looking at variation within a species or, or let's say variation within a biblical kind or whether they're different uh, kinds altogether. Um because I because uh, because the um um the Africanus and Afarensis specimens are kind of from different areas. East Africa, Afarensis, South Africa, Africanus. And interesting there's a there's a kind of battle on about where the, who, which was the first Australopithecine or whatever, because they, they kind of re, they regularly seem to redate a lot of the stuff, and and so a lot of the finds in South Africa, they push the date back, so because they want it seems like uh, so that things like <clears throat> even Prometheus could be the sort of the originator, the original uh, um, uh, first Australopithecine, or that or they gave birth to the genus Homo, you know. So there's there's a bit of a competition between uh, the um, Australopithecines in the south and Australopithecines in East Africa, like Afarensis, as to which is the which is the first sort of uh, <clears throat> which or which guy basic which which was the ancestor of of the uh, the future sort of hominids that led to the genus Homo or whatever. So that's an interesting argument, but um, yeah. So, so but I but I yeah I believe Africanus. Uh, it was just some differences in the skull, uh, but uh, it was an, it, but it's sort of a, an, uh, just an apish primate, really. Yeah. The skulls of uh, the Australopithecines, they're they're very small. They seem to be very um, similar to, and this is something noted by Dr. Bergman as well, uh, uh, like apes and primates and that sort of thing. They're they're you know their skulls. The, 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 the brain was small. The brain was generally oh. small. Yeah, that, well, yeah, that, they were generally in, uh, uh, yeah, but chimpanzee, gorilla size, sort of varied from, you know, 400 to 500. Um, you were, you were pr 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 pretty much all of them were under 600 cubic centimetres. Um, yeah, that, they were small, uh, yeah, but, but, uh, um, now, I don't think, as we'll see, I don't, I, I don't think it's so much the 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 brain size per se, although they were small, but it's the organisation of the brain. And I don't, and I, and I think it, from from a Christian perspective, what makes us human, we have got the spirit of God in us. God can have a breath to us. So, that, so there's something different about humans, and which, are, but that relates to the, I guess, to the mind and and. The non-physical aspect, which which you can't, which you can't sort of produce physical evidence of, but but I believe it's a, the neural organization is very important, and how the brain is organized, all the connections and stuff. But then you have the, this thing called the mind, and some people believe there is no mind; it's just the brain creates the mind, that epiphenomena, right. whereas somehow right. the mind is separate, and, and so yeah. Hey, um. Uh, I know I don't have this on my questions, but I realized that I didn't, I forgot about putting it on my questions. 
but I am curious. I don't know a lot about it. Uh, maybe you do. Uh, also, Pythagoras Gari. Are, are you uh, familiar with that one? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I just, I think it's. Um, I, I probably have to kind of. I think. It, I think. I, I think I did a, a thing here. Where, uh, uh, yeah, it's it's sort of a it 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 um it it's it's a sort of an, um I don't have to read I I it's one I haven't really I, I wrote about it in the book and so it's a it's more a typical australopithecine now uh, whether it kind of can be put in with one in the category of, of one of the other groups it's probably it probably just a, a bit more diversity within it a bit like you have. Africanus and Prometheus. This may be whether there's different diversity within Afarensis, a bit like you have Australopithecus and Amensis, which now some want to put back into Afarensis. So you have, so I don't know whether whether it's any different to Afarensis or not. Um, is uh, the Gari's uh, skull, um, is there anything unusual about that or is it pretty much like the way the other Australopithecus scenes look? Yeah. Um, it's it's just a, a few, it is a, is a few I think a, I think there's a few dental or cranial features, but again you you it's a sort of you get all these different features. Like if you if you have genetic variation, then you're going to get this, and you get the, you get this in humans too. Like like a um, I don't know if we'll get to it later, but, but you, even, even today you like you, the other week there was this thing about this um, ancient Chinese skull which. Um, which sort of was unique, and it had, had its jaw had sort of archaic sort of meaning, sort of uh, robust sort of um, features and modern features. Uh, and but that doesn't worry uh, new species or whatever. But that means that if there were if two groups were breeding which were different, uh, say in modern humans and an archaic or whatever robust human type like Hylobagensis against erectus were breeding. Then you expect that you mosaic patterns to emerge, which are kind of unique, or sometimes blender patterns where, say the say the uh, <coughs> brow ridges, say a modern human who don't have much brow ridge, uh, interbreed with uh, say say um, erectus or hylobagensis, which are strong brow ridges, you get might get medium ones, or it may be that that's a sort of blended character, but in 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 other ways you may get sort of uh, the, the trait might be be sort of binary, either there or or it isn't. Like if it, like say you have a chin, it may be there or it isn't if they breed. So you get all these combinations and of genes, and that's what probably happened with the Australopithecines. That you, that you sometimes you get uh, blended characters, and sometimes mosaic patterns because uh, because you had these diverse apish primates initially certainly diverse, and they breeding together producing. These diverse outcomes. So I don't. <clears throat> looking at it, looks like a typical Australopithecine, and I don't. I, don't, I, I, I suspect it's belong to the same biblical kind as Afarensis, um, but I, I can't be. You can't be hundred percent sure. Um, Let's move on. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, what about Australopithecus uh, sediba? Um, and from what I saw, when I saw the picture of this, and I've actually read this as well. Their arms are kind of long, like what you expect the primate to look like. Yeah, um, you yeah. know, where their arms are are uh, longer than like you know, I'll reach all the way to the kneecaps. Oh, uh, there is something else I want to ask you about, Lucy. Um, yeah. On the the slanted knee thing, uh, how would you respond to that? I probably should have brought that up. Uh, uh, the you know where they found the femur and the kneecap. The it's kind of uh, like an angle or something like that. that, that yeah, the, the, the angle of the femur. Yeah, yeah. Well, the the angle of femur, like if if you put the um, the condyles at the end of the femur on a table, it'll kind of it'll angle that the, the femur will angle that way, so that so that if you had the legs together, it angles in, which which does support you, is gives you more stable stability if you walk on twos. Okay, so that probably, uh, but I believe sort of. Um, uh, I'm not 100 percent sure, but I think orangutans have have a have a some angle as well. Uh, chimpanzees tend to not have an angle. Certainly, humans have an angle, but I don't know how much of significance it is because, because I said it, 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 you know, 
I, I believe you look at the pelvis of Lucy, um, it's, it's tiny, <clears throat> it's different from a chimp, so you expect some variation and it was, it was likely designed to walk bipedal in trees on branches and stuff like that and then had a different pelvis, a different arrangement uh, um, in terms of it, it. Its body was not like a chimp. And so, but but yeah, it it it, it angled in uh, a little bit if you if you take that at face value. So, and and like I said, if if sort of um, apes in Europe dated millions of years before Lucy, supposedly, if you accept it, days these age was known, were able to walk bipedally, then then or had bipedal features, people shouldn't be. I don't see the big deal, honestly, about. Some bipedal features and afferences. I mean, some people, it, it, it's a big thing to me. It's nothing because I already accept that most apes are optionally can walk on twos, mm -hmm. even existing apes. It's just a matter of degrees. And gibbons are, are gibbons are the, of the existing apes, or, or given it's a lesser ape, that is the most bipedal ape in existence, uh, as far as I know. I don't know whether Lucy was as good as gibbons. I don't know. But um, so, I, it doesn't really worry me that I, I, I yeah, I, I don't really want to argue things like that because it's just a if it's a if it's a biological fact, it's a fact. But but it does it's it's no big deal really. But uh, Doctor but, Martin did say that there, there's always similarities with the kneecaps because that's that protects that area. So so you would yeah. say that that you know yeah humans have some similarities there. We also have some you know some yeah, primates yeah. have some similarities and and yeah. optional bipedal so you would expect their kneecaps to be made to some degree to be able to stand on two legs even for a limited amount yeah. of time yeah well I, well it wasn't so much the kneecap i was talking to I was talking about the the femur the angle it makes when it it, it, it forms part of the knee you know so okay. that but, but the angle it comes in <coughs> yeah all right all right um sorry about that I, I i just realized that that i need to ask you about that um, all right, um, Sadiba, uh, its uh, its arms were longer. Um, would you say that it, that it, that it has I don't know monkey like qualities, ape like qualities? I mean, uh, or at least prompt mate ish. I mean, how would you uh, describe I think, Sadiba? Well, I, well, this this is Sadiba here. Okay, this is it a juvenile? I don't know. They're supposedly eleven. I don't know how, how old it was. It about uh, twelve. They reckon it's about twelve to thirteen years old. Okay, that's a sediba here. I think that I think it's a little embedded in rock. So, but anyhow, this is the front of it. So that's that's a sediba specimen here. Um. Okay. Is the white? So that, uh, sorry, it, it, sorry. Is the white uh, not found with it? That's right. Yeah. So that's the way this interpretation. So, so basically, it's a juvenile. So it's not fully developed. So probably the, the facial features features would develop more. As it, and and some evolution I believe is just a, a variation of Africanus once again. Uh, I think I think that the they make see they make a lot of the about this stuff, but um, again it was again and and about the pelvis and stuff about it, you know, being for bipedal. But um, it, again, I just say so. So what? I mean, the right. thing is, Lou, Lou, it, it's okay. It, its pelvis may not have been like Lucy's, but but it was sort of that type of pelvis, not like Lucy's, but different. But it wasn't like a chimp pelvis. But like I said, Australopithecines were a separate group, and I know some people would say, "Oh, there, there was a mixture of bones," and there were some bones mixed in. But it, the thing is, I don't believe that the pelvis belonged to it. I believe that pelvis belonged to Sediba because if if it was a human that was mixed in with it. Then you'd expect to find other human bones, human skulls, and you just wouldn't find a pelvis. Community find a pelvis and say that's um, that was human, but the other things belonged to Sadiba. So I believe the pelvis, everything what belonged to Sadiba. There may be some other bones mixed in from from whether it's uh, some other animals or something, but generally most of the bones belong to Sadiba. But uh, again, and some those are some that have analysed have said it, it would have. If if it, if it walked bipedally again, optionally, it would have been been walking that really, really strange, very strange way. So not human like at all. 
and but it was designed for life in the, it was designed for climbing in the trees basically a tree climber again maybe walk by peeling branches that would be very helpful you know because you can stand on the branches and, and reach out to get through uh, much more effectively if you're only going to walk on all fours so on a, on a tree branch you know so that's um that's and, 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 and I think you mentioned that in your book too. I think you mentioned yeah. something about if if it was bipedal, it would have been it would walk in a way that's it's different from from say humans uh, yeah. today would walk. It, it, uh, it, it, look, if, if, even if they walk like humans, I don't I don't see any evidence of that. If if the morphology was there, I I would accept it. And I would still say so what because you got apes there in the past, and and there's nothing in the Bible about it. But the thing is, there, there is no. I don't see any evidence of that. But 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 you know if I can if someone can show me that they you know not not made up not made up morphology not not things made up that the, the evolutionists sort of you know make up uh, feet and twist uh, things but actually show me where they have human feet human legs human pelvis together then I then I, I believe they could have walked human but I, I I don't see any evidence that anything walked like a human but but they walked. Likely, yeah, like would it walked on twos, but then so does existing apes, and it's just a matter of what to, to what degree. But they, they would seem to be built for climbing the trees mostly, and that's what that's what Oxnard concluded too with the Australopithecines. Although, let, let me again read what he concluded, um, about them, um, because it seems to be an important vote. Um, the um, um Let's see. Uh, there's a there's a thing here. Just trying to find the. It's a. I'm trying to find the quote. Um, if it's okay, we're going to. Yeah, yeah. It's I was just trying to move. Just kind of yeah, can move yeah. forward. It's getting kind of late. I will try to get through these questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, here it is. He said, "Well, I'll go here." For instance, though bipedal, it is likely that their bipedality was mechanically different from that of humans. Though terrestrial, it's further likely that these fossils were accomplished other realists, that is, adapted living on the in the in the trees. And a combination of the two functions have been the same, so the creature is certainly unique among hominoids. So basically, saying they're unique. So you have this bipedalism that but it's not human like and then you and they could climb trees you combine it and you've got a unique creature and the skulls indicate they were unique and so well, I don't say they're apes as better as there are they were extinct apish primate group a bit like monkeys well they're not monkeys but if you if you imagine the monkeys are not apes either classified as ape yeah like when you see <clears throat> uh, um other bipedal creatures or even primates when they walk, yeah. whenever they walk by people, it's never like a human being walks by no, people. No, and no. birds, when they walk by people, it's different. Penguins, yeah. I mean, you just kind of can yeah. see that the way in which by uh, what they, they walk by people is not yeah. going to be exactly the same as humans. And so, even if that was the case, it doesn't seem like it would be a normal human, very human. Uh, they're not. They're not walking on a normal human. And even if I did, I still say so what because. Uh, there's nothing in the Bible about it, but it, but but the thing is, it they didn't walk in any right. There's no evidence I did. They, they were, their feet more apish, their legs were short, and the the sort of the pelvis weren't they weren't human, um, human any they weren't human like. So I think people to get too caught up in this, uh, and I, I think people need to step step back and 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 uh, um, yeah. I, I think it's just a react, reaction to to evolutionists claiming that that a sign of an ape man or hominin is it start first started walking upright, and that, uh, any any sign of bipedalism means it's, it's an ape man. But but the thing is, it, you know, every, every, I'm sure there'd be bipedal things in the, it, it, in a lot of apes that you can interpret as being a bipedal feature. So if you don't have any, so so you could it's, it becomes sort of like. But you know, so so rather than sort of saying, "Oh, no, no, this can't be, but this can't be bipedal, this can't be bipedal," uh, you, you know, you just say, "So, so what?" You know, um, you know, it, and but also the thing is, bones are fickle; they'll sing any song you want. 
usually. So you've got to be aware of who's you interpreting interpret it. The, yeah, you can interpret you know, the false flag evidence. Yeah. But I'm, I'm going to skip 10 and 11, unless you really want to talk about them, because that's, uh, yeah. I know that's, no, uh, those are it's, it's going on. Have it, I'm not really familiar with them, but uh, I do want to get to Naledi, and that's in uh, question yeah. 12. Uh, yep. What about Homo and Naledi? Uh, that's that's yep. been heavily into to controversy. Netflix dropped a documentary about it, and yep. Yep. some evolutionists also produced some videos on it. So, um, uh, what it what is uh, the Homo and Naledi, and what is the controversy surrounding that? I know that it had supposed to have a, a head of a Australopithecine, so that's that that automatically makes it unusual, and they put it in the line of human beings and. They claim that 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 they made artwork and buried the dead, just like uh, uh, yeah. a yeah, Neanderthal. So, uh, could you explain that one? Sure. Um, well, it it doesn't really have a head of numbers. This is this is a well. These are two Naledi skull. This is a this is a composite skull. That that's the one the first we're coming out with. Although, if you look at the um, this shows you the blue bit is was actually what's missing. So. So you can see a lot, a lot of the mid face region is missing, but but that was the first skull that they come up a composite skull. Okay, now it's more like a Homo erectus, but it's small cranial capacity. This is, but this is a composite. Now this is the, this is not a composite. It's actually, I'll sh I'll show you the picture because it's probably quite important to realize. Could you this is the skull. This is this is it here. Now notice this. Notice this here, the only part where it's joined to the top, the, the mid face is joined to the top is in this region here, which means you can make the bottom stick out more. And so basically here, here you can see here. Could you do me a favor? Hold up. Uh... How, how, whether this is that, that prognathic, I don't know. It may, you know, because I think you could kind of, whether, where it's a bit more vertical, I, me a I, favor. I don't know. Yeah. This, this is a this is a, this is the LES one skull from the um what's it called the uh uh where I think I had a thing here from um, the uh, the De La Sede chamber <clears throat> so that's that, so that so that had a cranial capacity of six hundred and ten cubic centimeters so that's sort of that this is above the Australopithecine range it's in the Damanese Homo erectus range okay. So, that, so this is basically you do me a, a favor. Could you hold up the Australopithecine uh, um, uh, skull again and put them like side by side so we can see see the difference? Well, but, okay, okay. This is a this is a male Australopithecine. Okay, this you can see here. Uh, this is the, this is the Australopithecine. See the large face in the Australopithecine. That's this is uh, the, Prometheus, isn't it? This is a chart. This is Afarensis. Afarensis, okay. That this is wow. the. It's show, I can show you the. Um, is it smaller you, than the Australopithecines? Then I can show you the Africanus thing. I get the Africanus one. So this is the. This is the. Well, I only got the cranium, but so this is the Africanus one. Here, okay. So they kind of this has that this has a jaw in it. I think they make this kind of. A bit pro more prognathic than it is because because the joint allows you to kind of it's a bit like the Homo 1470 man if we get to that that the face is made more vertical to make it uh, they made that more vertical to make it more human this time they make it more uh, sticking out to make it less human because because uh, because uh, yeah but anyhow that's sort of more Homo it's more Homo erectus like. So you're um, saying that yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not within the range of Australopithecines, but it may be within the range of Austral or uh, Homo erectus. Yeah, well, 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 it's more the form of the skull. You've got the the brow ridges here, um, the the face, um, like a, uh, it's it's sort of the the kind of the. I, I'm just going by the, the some of the descriptions uh, and. Uh, a lot, some evolutionists believe that it's an early Homo erectus that they were analyzing it. But but the thing the, the thing is, um, 
it's it's a bit like the the, the Damanese erectus. The, the brain size is in that range too. There's some very small, and, and um, if we talk about uh, the Damanese erectus, there, there's there's strong, really strong evidence they were humans because they were looking after their the infirm uh, likely for years. So let me just diverge for give you an example. So this this skull here, I don't know. What the, I don't know ex it, its exact brain size. This is a Damanese hamerectus, but it, it wouldn't have been much smaller than or than the that uh, hominolody skull. But look at its look at the, look at the upper jaw, the maxilla here. Look how the tooth sockets are worn down. Look at its jaw. It's all worn down. Two sockets have been reabsorbed, and so the, what the evolutionists are saying is. That would take years to occur. When a disease or losing a tooth, the, the once you lose a tooth, the bone reabsorbs it, and so it couldn't have likely have survived by itself for years. And it could, it couldn't eat hard food; it has to eat soft food. So someone would have to look after it. So this was Damanisa hemorrhectus in Georgia, and so basically, that indicates that they cared for their um, those that were infirm, sick might beyond what any primate could ever do. So that indicates that the Manisa homorectus, that, that that that's a that's a human feature. Now whether these were some other disorder like a I, I believe the homonoleti and the Damanese that one one thing they have in common is they the the the, the, the whole region of, of the Caucasus in Georgia is a it's a goiter region if you heard of cretinism. No, and now cre cretinism it's a non-genetic disorder but it basically um you know you know that, that's what i have iodine supplements and i've because it basically does so much um damage to if if you don't get it that's why you know big people have big swellings in the neck if I, if you don't have iodine in your diet then you get this big swelling because your thyroid um Gland is working overtime to work to basically generate thyroid hormone because it hasn't because it needs iodine to do that. But in the, if in fetal life you don't have uh, the the, um, the the fetus doesn't get iodine up enough, the thyroid gland doesn't develop properly, and then once you the, the child is born, it can't produce thyroid hormone or not enough of it, and so what it does it creates developmental disorders, but it also has the capacity to reduce brain size by 50 percent so you could so that may explain why some of the homo erectus specimens like uh, because that in this in a post grain or skeleton there's some strange features in there i'm not going to go into it it's more technical and stuff and other but there's some strange features there and charles oxnard uh, um with the hobbit and have your homo floresiensis that that small brain thing here he 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 and some other evolutionists suggested that suffered that was a that was a, a modern human that suffered from cretinism. I believe it was a Homo erectus type human that suffered from cretinism, a robust human, but it had cretinism, and that's why his brain was so small. And that may explain why this these brains were so small because they suffered from some development disorder like a cretinism because that's it's non genetic. It doesn't have to. You don't have to go through a pop, you have to be fixed in a population, you, you know, inherit it. It's just the environment. So in one generation, you could get, if, if you have a lot of goiter, then a certain percentage of the population have cretinism and they can get funny development. And according to um, get the Charles Oxnard, he's the one that looked at uh, Strabhifacin and he, he's an anatomist. He says, um, uh, basically, um, so you can have all these uh, differences in effect and things like that. I'm just trying to find the, the quote that I had uh, um, here. The uh, oh, it always happens. Um, it says many many of the pathological features of cretinism mimic the primitive characters of evolution, making it easy to mistake pathological features for primitive characters. Difference can be disentangled by understanding the underlying biology of characters. So what what this disorder does is it mimics primitive characters evolution. So so basically you have these regions where in the past 
study and know about iodine deficiencies. And so that a certain percentage of the population may have had a cretinism. And then, uh, now I don't know, I, I can't be 100% sure, but it's a plausible theory. Now, so where do, and, and but, the, but the evidence that's coming out now is, um, at first there was no evidence that they, ha they were running. These, these got buried in some deep, dark cave in South Africa that was almost, very almost impossible to get to by a normal human because it, because of their size, and but later but later it, it turns out that that Berger's claiming and that they find evidence they used fire, and then it turns out they may have, looks like they buried their dead in there, and then it turns out they they made carvings on cave walls engravings a bit like Neanderthals did. Uh, they found similar similar carvings to what Neanderthals done in, in certain places, and so and and they even found a tool basically <clears throat> uh, next to the hand of or in one of the burials or something like that, uh, which looks like a tool, an advanced tool or something. So, if that's the case, then that that's only a that has to be a human behaviour. You know, you, only humans may not make deliberate fire for going in caves and burying the dead, and the thing is. We don't. I don't know whether these were buried there because they were deceased, and and the others were maybe larger brained. I don't know, but I think. But no one goes into a remote cave where you, where you may not even get out. All these dangers. It's very difficult to get into in the dark, but burying the dead. If it was an ape, you follow. Um, no one, no um, one goes to the trouble of burying an ape. So so whatever. If it was if it was buried like that, it was a, the it likely was a human. And so, um, so, so that that's my interpretation of that it, um, that it was likely these suffer from cretinism. But it it gets to the whole issue of, of brain size and intelligence. Now, the thing is, we we also you know there's this thing about um, that um, supposedly the evolution is like why. A lot of evolutionists now are against this idea that you know, Letty made fire, they buried the dead. The, and the reason is because it steps on their own theories because they like to think that, you know, humans evolved from a ape-like ancestor to the modern human brain size driven by in, intelligence and intelligence what was made the brain grow. But the thing is, there is no, there, there's basically no correlation, no significant correlation between brain size and intelligence. I did, this is a modern textbook, Fundamentals of Atmosphere Physiology. So, so it says, brain size varies considerably among individuals. The brains of males are on average about 10% larger than those of females due to differences in average body size. No correlation exists, exists between brain size and intelligence. Individuals with the smallest brains, 750 mils, which is 750 cc, and the largest brains, 2,100 mils or cc, are functionally normal. So basically, you can have, you know, over a thousand um, cc in different brain size, but no difference in intelligence. And in fact, let me read another quote. So you have here, this is from uh, Harold is, is dead now, but Harold Shapiro, Chairman Emeritus of the Department of Anthropology at the American Museum of Natural History. It says, although Anatoly France is said to have had a cranial capacity of only a little over 1100 cc, and von Hindenburg more than 800 cc, it would certainly not be general judgment that Anatoly France was the less intelligent. So the thing is, you have a difference of 700 cc. Anatole France had a Homo erectus size brain, yet he won the Nobel Prize. Uh, he, he won the won a Nobel Prize for literature, I think it was. So basically, you have you can have all the and, and another quote here. Let me one more quote because I think it's it's an important point because it gets to the whole thing. This is uh, Homo sapiens: the evolution of modern thinking by Frederick Coulomb and Thomas Wynne. Um, it says. It is meaningless. It is a meaningless number for comparing individuals of the same species to one another. Modern human brains vary in size from 1100 cc to almost 2000 cc, and there is no known correlation between brain size and intelligence. However, one chooses to measure it. 
Although I do it, the, the humans vary more than that. You can get, in fact, the the low the lowest human I know of normal intelligence. Uh, I've got it here somewhere. Dave Daniel Lyon. Okay, he he basically had a. Um, I just find the information. Yeah. He he had, he had a he was a 1.55 meters weighed 63.8 kilograms. His weight brain weighed 680 grams. If you convert that to CC, you get depending on which method you use, you get either 660 or 690 CC. Um, so that's in a six. So that's in the sort of lower Homo erectus range. And he basically um, he had normal intelligence. So what that that tells you. Even even these people, it, and that was it. And then the number of skulls that we've measured were estimated that the cranial capacity of is minuscule compared to the total number of people who ever lived or live. So basically, you probably find there are people with normal intelligence with the brain size of a Homo naledi. So even if, even if they're not deceased, they still could have a normal brain size. But the other thing is that ev evolutionists. Uh, I'll try to get an argument quickly through because it's dragging on. Um, but that evolutionists believe that intelligence is what drove the large brain size to evolve. But the thing is, as I quoted, there in existing humans, there's no significant correlation between brain size and intelligence. So what? That, so how could you get brain size getting larger, evolving, if it, there's no selective advantage of it? In fact, it's selected against because it's because of the um, the brain uses a lot of energy so basically uh, to develop a large brain if it wasn't any good would basically be a waste of energy so it'd be selected against but the, the but the, so, but so what they do is they say that there's no selective advantage now but there was in the past but that's special pleading so what they're saying is you can have a foul you so the instant I gave you can have a Difference in brain size between several chimp brains now, making no difference in intelligence. But in the past, during in um, when uh, supposedly we were evolving from from an ape sized brain, there was selective value. If I calculate out on average in a generation or not amounts to a few pinheads of brain tissue, there was selective advantage of that. But there, but but there was no selective advantage in 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 today. No difference in intelligence between people who have difference in brain size of you know several chimp brains um wow. difference so so basically that's just preposterous you know and so basically there's no uh so, so basically so there's no way to get from a small to a large brain if you can't actually there's no selective value in it so so that sort of even if evolution is true which it isn't you can't evolution could not happen if there's no selective advantage of developing large brain size, and there would have to be a significant advantage to it, and there just isn't. And so basically, um, uh, it's a and and so I think that's important. People understand it's, it's not a given, but that but this is why but that this is why they're so against the burger thing because I've read the things. It is because he's, he's found this the species we suppose I believe is human, but basically. Low brain size, but they were in, very intelligent, and and he, evolution say no, they couldn't be that intelligent, and and intelligence um, was selected for, and that's how we got to be human with our large brains. But he's found it like that. The humans are that small brain size were intelligent, and what I'm saying to you is, there's no evidence that that the difference in brain size makes any difference, significant difference in intelligence, and so there's no way to get it from evolving a uh, large brain from a small brain anyhow according to evolutionary theory and it's just one more argument against it along with genetic entry the waiting time problem irreducible complexity right. all these things drive a dagger through the evolutionary uh, heart or right. the evolution so you're saying that that these uh that there is evidence that they're human because if they uh, if there's evidence that, that they buried the dead and build fires and things of that nature yeah. Um, but a lot of evolutionists yeah. are kind of arguing in a circle, assuming that if their head is, is small and therefore they weren't very intelligent and therefore right. your dad has nothing to do with whether they're human or not. 
but then they're just kind of but, arguing. Yes, I did, they're saying they didn't bury the dead. They're, they're, they're having to argue because 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 if, if someone goes to trouble burying the dead, that cry that not only humans do that when the animals, but that we believe other humans too. So so if they did that, then they, then they can't doubt their intelligence. So so there's, so, there's, so, there's, so, there's, so there's a lot of us just saying, well, no, no, these weren't buried. Somehow they just. The, they just dropped the bodies there, and I somehow got covered over or whatever. They, they're disputing it, but I think it's, I think that I'm looking at the data. It seems like the, the argument is pretty good, and and the engravings. I know oh, other humans had to come in and make the engravings, you know. So so they're saying that I couldn't have done any of this stuff. They had to be done by other things, or they, the burials weren't real. The engravings were made by other humans. The fires weren't real, or they were made by other humans. If you follow me, because it's right. it destroys the whole argument that intelligence was only that was a selective value that made larger brains. If intelligence was already there when they were small brains, then the, then why would the why would humans evolve large brains? Because it just wastes energy. If I can, right. I have a uh, friend that has a, um, an, a, another theory on that on the the, the uh, as far as you know, like small humans, like the Hobbit and stuff. He he described it as Alan Dorfinism. Um, would you say that that is a valid view, or do you think that I don't know? Well, what is your opinion? Well, look, look, look at the Hobbit. I, I don't, I'm, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't think it's been proven what exactly it, it suffered from something. So correct, I think correctness is a very plausible theory because Oxnard gives he 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 describes how the bones were formed, how, why they had the Hobbit had such large feet. Why? Why the wrist look like some of the wrist bones were chimp-like? Because it relates to the the ossification process of the bones and how uh, things like that. So so he explains in detail. That's why I like that. Where, uh, but but look, I, I think it, there's been a lot of evolutionists have suggested all these other theories as well. So I I, I think it's a, still an open question. You know, yeah, you know, we, nothing's been proven, so I think it's valid to. How uh, suggest what it is, you know, the, the original proposal of, of the Hobbit. So, this is what we're talking about, Homo floresensis. Is that, um, you can see the nasal region is missing. It, it, is that it was a dwarf Homo erectus that, that suffered island dwarfing, that it lived in an environment where, the, because of the limited resources, they, they kind of shrank or whatever. It's because it had resembled sort of, and, and in fact, it, it the, the this this skull here is sort of sp supposed to resemble Homo erectus. This is a, this is an Indonesian Homo erectus, and I guess parts of although it's small, but this is a, they sort of you can see the back region here. So, some features are similar, so some are suggesting it's a dwarfed Homo erectus. I su I suggest I don't now before what what happened with, with in this case was that. So there's a lot of people, non-evolutionists, were suggesting this is a modern human that suffers of some sort of pathology. So there's a lot of controversy. So what happened is they redated the thing, and and conveniently they did. Instead of being 18,000 years old, the new dating gave it from 60 to 100,000 years, which conveniently put it out of the time frame of the arrival of Homo sapiens in the area according to the evolutionary timeline. And so everyone. Everyone proposing it was a modern human that had pathology. It's been very quiet since, but that that but that just shows you the uh, the nature of dating methods that are always subject to change. Whenever something comes up, they redate, find another date, and but but what they <coughs> it was originally suggested it was a dwarf Homo erectus. Now now there's an argument: was it a dwarf Homo erectus or was it some australopithecine like or Homo or Homo habilis like? Creature that, which I believe Australopithecus right. anyhow, and, uh, emerged out of Africa and got there, but the, there's no trace of these Australopithecus outside Africa, and so I don't think that's why. Well. So, uh, so I think Homo, it's, it's, uh, uh, Homo, uh, Homo uh, Naledi, uh, there is some uh, controversy about the dates too, because the, the from what I understand, yeah. there were different uh, dating methods gave them different dates, and then eventually yeah. they just kind of rejected them all. For the sake of something about the sedimentary layers or something like that, some something that they did with the uh, um, rock that they I, just kind of. I think I think that I think I settled. For, I, I think a lot of the dates in that South African area is all it's all all over the place, and I think I settled for a date to two or two or, two or three hundred thousand years ago. 
but but they did carbon dating and they found the carbon date and gave an order of magnitude less. But they they that what happens when they don't like it, they say it's uh contaminated or something like that for any reason. So that's ridiculous. much less than it, the it did give a carbon date. Isn't that right? Sorry. That's much less than right. the Australopithecine dates. And then like the uh yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but both both dates are much less than this. I, I, there, there would have been no, it, if according to evolutionary timeline, where's my um the Homo naledi dates, there would be no Australopithecines there at all. Like, uh, they died, they would have died out by the time of these. If and only uh, on the according to the evolutionary timeline. So, so even the, according the, to the Burger, own... the Burger camp believed these were more like they, they they thought they were more like two million years old, and they were shocked that all the dates turned out young. So they couldn't really find a really old date. So they had to pick something to be a thousand. So even um, according to their own dating methods, it doesn't seem to line up consistently. With no, the, no. It, 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 it's sort of like yeah. It, some I, I even read somewhere that that they believe it, this this one of us reverting. It, it was it's it was evolving to be more primitive or something like that. So <laughs> yeah, and that was a serious. That's like me evolving, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah it, was, it was evolving back its primitive features. Oh uh, yeah. Of, all right. Um. All right. Well, how would they? line up i was kind of curious about this you you brought this up in the email as well uh what do evolutionists believe on us seeing and their evolutionary development in terms of i mean how do they line these up uh i know that uh, some evolutionists think they're they're intermediates um yeah. but obviously from the creation perspective they're not actually related to yeah. humans and so um uh how would they line that up well, well, well i explain well, that i'm gonna turn my light on Okay, what what I think, what what they would say is um, what what they would generally say is okay. It, it's either afferences or they're arguing over was it was as now they're arguing which one of these Africanus afferences was the was the first Australopithecine or whatever that and. Although some say, you know, was it this is the Anamensis skull, so that so this this is but but this sort of uh, some believe these two were the same species anyhow, but so they saying okay this some so there were there were some earlier hominid there whether it was the Lanthropic or 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 um or or Tuchidensis or Australopithecus ramidus or Cadaba. But, but anyhow, which are all probably all likely apes, maybe or to, to Genesis was an Australopithecine as well. But anyhow, it's all based on the dates. But, but something like this evolved into something like that. Now, this is a Homo habilis game. This is the 1470 man. So this is this is one of the key things because they say this was transitional between that and Homo erectus. And creationists generally believe that, not all, but most believe that Homo erectus. So this is a African Homo erectus skull. Homo erectus was human. This is KNMER seven three seven three three skull. So so basically, uh, this 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 was one of the most one of the most famous skull, fourteen seventy man, and it's actually been, if you interpreted Homo habilis um, broadly as Homo habilis um, sensulato. It would form into Homobilus range. If you have a strict interpretation of Homobilus, then this is not Homobilus, it's Homo rudolfensis. Okay. I I look I just put them all in the, the broad range, Homo habilis. But what, what they done is uh, they said this was a, a, a transitional form link between the Australopithecine, say Afarensis, and the Homo erectus, or something like that. Now there, there's a lot of problems with that. One is that as Homo erectus gets pushed back further in a timeline, then you find some coexistence. Like I found a Homo erectus specimen system existing around the time of this lived. But the but the other thing is, they made this fight now. This is a, a bone clones re reconstruction or whatever. But and, and so I don't know how vertical that. I think when I originally reconstructed the device was even more vertical, and so I made it to to look very 
human like as possible the face or flat human because that's sort of the the human has a more vertical face but that but the one of the people who reconstructed it the Alan, Alan Walker it, it, it was reconstructed for for lots of bits hundreds of different bits I believe the cranium he he thought it was a big brain australopithecine but and he he argued against this making a face look like more human like but making a flat so one of the people the most knowledge about it actually thought it was a big brain australopithecine and some evolutionists believe this and other australopith uh, homo villa should be either assigned to the australopithecines or their own genus altogether and the thing is this, it, what 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 was the big thing about it is it had a large brain size or originally brain size up to around 800 cubic centimeters so that's very large but that but that was in general because of the the way they Reconstructed the face. Now, a group by uh, by Bromage did a basically um, reanalyze reanalyze this, and they reconstructed the face more like an australopithecine, which they believed it was. And so, basically, uh, I see I forgot the uh, I got the uh, the different things because I can't remember all these things in my head. Uh, in me here. And so, and so basically, what, um, what after this, you instead of sort of having brain size of AD or 852 cubic centimeters, there were even reports when I started doing this of brain size in the low 500 cubic centimeter range or 575 cc. Eventually, the Bromwich group estimate was 625 cubic centimeters, uh, although. I think under pressure they, they said oh, I'm probably about 700 cc. But the thing is, the, how they reconstructed it affected its large brain. So, but even if it even if it had the original brain size of 752 cc, there's a gor gorillas have been, a gorilla has been measured to have that same brain size. So so it's not so it's, it wasn't any larger than a gorilla, and but it's likely probably less because because they made it to be human because it was broken in bits. And the thing was. Uh, where is it? It was this. It was only this region here that was sort of that you could attach this any any way you wanted to this region here. So so you could make the face go that way or that way. And so that's that's the whole problem of a lot of this. You can reconstruct it to make to make it suit your fairies. So they were looking for an eight man, so they may try to make it look like that. And so basically, what what um, if so if you if you put all the australopithecines uh, Homo habilis in the australopithecines, there's not much left between. There's nothing between Homo erectus and australopithecines. And incidentally, there's no associated. If if you the only the Homo habilis, there's only one cranium. Crani the the postcranial elements associated with the crania crania elements. There's only one specimen really like that called OH62, and it found that it's postcranial it limb. At least in limb proportion, whereas ape like or more than Lucy's was. So basically, it's a stralopithecine like post cranial elements. So that, and so basically, um, uh, post cranial, what they know that is, they, they say is Homo habilis, is like a stralopithecine like. So basically, what you have then is Homo habilis was a sort of made up category. It was, um, in fact, Lewis Leakey was the one, well, group, it was actually his son, Jonathan, discovered the, four, the first Homo habilis specimen back in the early 1960s or whatever, I can't think of what year. He originally found the um, um, Australopithecus boise specimen, this this big, uh, called Nutcracker Man, it was had this huge skull with this big sagittal keel, regular robust, I don't have a picture of it here, but and but it, it was not, uh, the Evolutionists view the robust Australopithecines as evolution dead ends because they, <clears throat> they were so different from humans. So here, but they found a skull and they found these uh, stone tools there. I think just mode one, or, um, mode one sort of uh, olderized stone tools, which incidentally a lot of monkeys can produce these uh, unintentionally by smashing rocks together. That's how. So it's a, so you don't even know, you know, were they really tool, tools or just uh, monkeys bashing rocks or australopithecines bashing rocks and not not with the purpose of making tools but just breaking rocks which which i've seen monkeys do today but anyhow 
he attributed the tools to this uh, Australopithecus boisei because they were they were found they were found in a sort of same level as the as this um, Australopith robust Australopithecus cranium. But then they found soon after they found this this crania uh, of another specimen which which uh, they didn't think was a robust Australopithecine and a, and and it didn't have as many robust features. So he quickly said, no, the, the tools belong to this one instead. And, and that's how Homo habilis was formed. And there was a lot of controversy because a lot of people were saying it's just a variation of Australopithecus africanus or something like that. So again, you have this idea. And then there was different interpretation of brain size. Some interpreted as a robust Australopithecine, which made the brain size a lot less. And so you have... So you have this phenomenon going where if, if they want to find an ape and they try to make it as a, as they try to make uh, anything that looks apish more human and try to exaggerate the brain I think, size. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, David Minton uh, said it best in the book uh, Coming to Grips with Genesis. Either they try to uh, 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 upgrade ape fossils to human or they try to upgrade or downgrade human fossils to ape. Yeah, yeah. I'll try to uh, 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 like try to come up with some sort of a, a, a hybrid of the two or something like that. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. yeah that, but, that's uh, usually essentially, essentially they're, they're 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 trying to upgrade and they're trying or they're trying to downgrade it in some sense. Yeah. Uh, but what they're really missing is the 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 the, the, the you know they're claiming it's a step by step process. And they're missing those links, the chain of uh, transitionals yeah. between the and, and the thing is, and, and the thing them. is, so you have Australia Pythocene with its apish, it's a distinct apish primate group. The next group, Homo erectus, but we know from the, the they have found the Turkana boy, and the skeleton there was essentially, at least from the neck down, essentially like a modern human, a few robust features, but very human-like. So you go from an apish skeleton to a human skeleton and there's nothing in between. So so in a sense that showed there is no transitional form. But you have you have these um robust features. In fact, a lot of these humans which are usually found early flood, they have robust features in their skulls and even post grainy they're, they're built they're built kind of quite ruggedly. Um but um they're not they're not transitional form, you know. You don't see these features as much today, but you see, you'll still see people with strong brow ridges and 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 sort of sloping foreheads, but not as not as prevalent. The typical form of modern humans is more a vertical forehead and sort of just not very much brow ridges, and and you have a a, a chin and, and things like that. Whereas some of these most of these robots had a chin lacking chin and things like that. But they, but some of them, like the, the Neanderthals, the brain size were quite quite large, and even some of the, and other another robust uh, specimen like the one I talk about, Sujang, China, sort of the erectus like features, eighteen hundred cubic centimeters. So, so they're very large brain size, much larger than the average human of, of around thirteen hundred forty five cubic centimeters. So, that, so that basically there is nothing transitional. Uh, there is variety. Uh, certainly in the human kind, as there is in the Australopithecus kind. There were a variety in Australopithecines. There were variety among apes. There's a variety among existing monkeys. There's all there's all this variety, but they're not transit transitioning from one one group to another. He said combine ape and human fossils. It's in, uh, again, it's in uh, searching for Adam. Uh, he said, combine ape and human fossils, uh, declaring them to be one individual, or upgrade fossil apes to ape man, downgrade yeah. fossil humans to ape man. Yeah, so yeah. they're they're doing yeah. one of those three things usually. Yep. All right. Um. Uh, I did have a question. Yeah. Uh, so you'd say. Uh, Australopithecus or uh, Homo habilis uh, is maybe a made-up species, possibly. I think I think Homo, I think Australopithecus means like look, uh, well, you you got to put it. I'm saying they all belong in the same category. Now, whether the Australopithecus were one or more biblical kinds, that's open to debate. But Homo habilis, they don't belong. The genus Homo because they don't belong in the genus Homo. They were not human, although 
problem problem is evolution sometimes like when i say human i know some people some evolutionists mean anything in a genus homo which and that means uh really apish things like the homo most homo habilis specimen so what even some evolutionists are saying put don't they don't belong in the genus homo they should either be in a separate category or, or put them in with the australopithecines and i believe they homo habilis should most of them they belong with the australopithecines most of them um, whether, whether, whether some are probably Africanus, uh, some may you put in their own species. I don't know how many separate species you have, but there, there's probably too many species in the Australopithecines at the moment. And one guy in a recent article, article he he kind of grouped them in the Australopithecines as like there were five species in there. He sort of merged a lot together and things like that. Right. And, and it's, well, we're going to skip uh, questions 15 and 16 yeah. and 17 because we already talked a little bit about Homo erectus. We um, uh, we haven't really talked about Homo neanderthals, but we touched on burying the dead and, and things like that and other yeah. signs that they that they were definitely were human. Um, uh, well, I do want to ask neanderthals you really easy, that, that They were clearly human. So, yeah. but, they just have some know. unique features. or well, it really... A lot of the features, from what I understand, is that the features uh, that are in uh, Neanderthals will, uh, are present in, in some modern humans. So it's it's not yeah. all completely unique. They well, might the have thing some is, we, we, know, we know from DNA that humans were interbreeding with Neanderthals, and so according to biological species <coughs> concept, they were the same species. And the same with the mysterious Denisovans. They, they were, there's this shows that there's Denisovan DNA in the human genome and, and in the animal one. They, they went to breed with the animals as well. And I, a lot of people believe the Denisovans were even evolutionists, but they believe that uh, it's, it's a lot of the Chinese specimen, Homo heidelbergensis, or even some erectus specimen, like the Nangdong Homo erectus uh, remains in, in Indonesia, were the Denisovans. So basically, because what I found of these mystery Denisovans, um, like they found a skull, they did ancient protein analysis and on, on the on the jaw, sorry, part of a jaw is very robust. And and the bits of pieces I found a skull and can, can be very robust, erectus like. So basically, but what it shows is that likely all these uh specimens of the species were that I've put separate species, which all should should really all belong in the one species, Homo sapiens, were, were interbreeding. And in fact, in one book, the, the, the book, The Human Lineage, these are, these evolutionists, so this is probably the most comprehensive uh, overview of the fossil record by evolution, evolutionary paleontologist uh, Matt, Matt Carpenter and Fred Smith. They were, they were putting, except for Homo erectus, they were putting everything, whether it's Denisovans, the um, Hydrohyde of Agensis, Neanderthals, and a lot of things, they were putting a subspecies of Homo sapiens. And, because, and, and, and if you look at the fossil record, you find that all, a lot of the modern humans, uh, supposedly even though early, they still have these so-called archaic characters in them. There are some, they still carry archaic characters, the early ones, means they were interbreeding. So basically, if they're interbreeding, they have the same species. And even they have some, which might, a lot of people look at the, Solar man, which is a Nangdong Homo erectus, Homo erectus specimens, as Homo erectus, they they classify them as Homo heidelbergensis, but they classify them as a subspecies of Homo sapiens. So some that I was look at as Homo erectus, even they classify as a subspecies of Homo sapiens. So basically, um, yeah, it, it what you're getting is that all these robust humans and the modern type humans they were interbreeding, and yeah. so basically. Yeah. You, producing all this variety and and, and so you, you get all this unique combination which you get if you interbreed people that are very di look, look yeah. different you know With it, if you look at animals uh you can get different species to breed with their own kind as long as they're breeding with their own kind like look at dogs, dogs wolves. yeah dogs wolves and and cows yeah. can all interbreed however humans can only breed with other humans um, they can't actually breed and, and have children with animals like what you see in oh. mythology with the minotaur. But it, but it, but even but even dogs, wolf wolves uh, would are still part of the sort of general dog kind. Like if I can interbreed, so but you have all this variety, so that dogs don't breed with cats. So basically, you have and but, but a lot of cats 
can, you know, tigers can breed with lions and stuff like that. So you have all this sort of uh, thing. So they were probably about an original kind. I don't, I don't know how many kinds there were, but humans, particularly early on, there's probably a lot of diversity. And so you have, and and uh, you know, I, I, I tend to look at um, that probably the earliest humans were, were more robust because one thing biblically is that, you know, I don't believe that the robust features were a process, the aging process, but uh, but if you look at the Bible. Before the flood and even after the flood, people had long lifespans, you know. And 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 even after the flood, people lived for hundreds of years. Now, no human today could live for hundred years because they're falling apart. Even, uh, when you get in the forties, you, you start to lose bone mass, particularly I think women, particularly. But you, you kind of you shrink, you, you you know your your spine shrinks, but, um, and things like that. And and you're not going and so something so certainly the aging process development process had to be different. And I like like if you're going to live for hundreds of years, probably you would, maybe maybe there's something in the development too that made you more robust, strong, and that's maybe explains why you had why early humans had some a lot of robust features because they were designed to live for a lot longer, and things like that. And I don't know what the environment was like. And, and you know a lot of in the Andes a lot of cold adapted to adapted they were adapted to live in the cold as well, which uh, the environment can also affect features and things like that. But I believe the lifespans because ha you have to take take the whole if you're taking the Bible you've got to take it as a whole. But I feel that that could be one of the keys to explaining why you have these sort of robust features. And as the lifespans decline, the, the sort of modern form takes over. Now I don't know. Exactly when that happened, at Babel, I, I suspect of a robust and modern humans at Babel. But you know how it all happened, I don't know. But but I think what one evolutionist said you can explain the annual difference in Neanderthal by by basically um, clocks that determine uh, again fired hormone, the rate of fired hormone secretion during development. If you change a clock, you can actually uh, or, or or basically the release of that hormones. Which is controlled by other hormones, um, and it basically would produce Neanderthal-like anatomy. So it's all during development, and 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 you can see that juvenile erector specimens look like look more like the adults. That it wasn't a not an effect of aging, but it's all produced during development. So I think something was different early on in development, which produced these more robust humans. Um, we don't have the full picture yet. But I certainly would like. I've... A lot of people think that um, the Tower of Babel, when all these different uh, people groups went out, that this would have, you know, kind of isolated the genome in, in in kind of a more dispersed sort of way, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah. And so and, you and, and it, with it, all these different people groups and that sort of thing. It, it, even a Tower of Babel, if if God changed the languages of people, that even that would have to be. You'd have to do something to the brain because you store. At least you, to access the memories and and in different languages, would you'd have to kind of restructure the neural synapses to 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 even so so something you would have done something to the brain, and who knows what else. So we so we just so we don't we have God doesn't give us the full picture of everything that happened, uh, you know. And sometimes you just trust Him, but you know, um, the worst the worst the worst sort of. Things even when the fall of man, we know that something something happened to the animals, you know, after the fall of man. That in 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 the in, likely in the design, it talks about it, what and likely not just a snake, you know, that was made to uh, to sliver on the ground. So we so there's there's, mm -hmm. there's there's things we just things we don't know, you know. Um, the Bible doesn't give a full account; it just right. tells us what things. It, what is this uh, uh the creation perspective on I know that most of the fossil uh, um, uh, record is considered to be uh, as as a result of the global flood. Um, but how do they view? Uh, how do Christians typically view like the Australopithecines and that sort of thing? I know Prometheus is considered to be uh, a, a, a creature that died during the uh, um, Ice Age. Is that right? Well, actually, Australopithecus prometheus that's the, you mean you mean Neanderthals that died during the Ice Age or something like that, I don't know. 
Australopithecus prometheus, that was the Australopithecus seen in South Africa. So that so that okay. that was just ext extinct apish primate, you know, that, that was just a variation of Africa Australopithecus africanus. Now, like, now, a lot of people believe that Neanderthals were cold adapted. I think that's what you that was you meant to say, uh, and and they lived during a very cold, and they were confined to <coughs> sort of more than northern hemisphere and very cold adapted, particularly in Europe, that they, they lived in cold extremes, and that explains some of their the rugged body size, which, which may well be the case, and they they kind of died died out there, uh, which which may well be the case. So they, so there was a Ice Age, after the flood, after after a certain, I don't know how many hundreds of years, but it was an Ice Age, I think, I don't know, whether it lasted 500 years, I'm not sure how many hundred years it lasted, but, and then uh, uh, we, we're still seeing the, the glaciers left from that today in certain parts of Europe and, and right. North Hemisphere, but uh, yeah, yeah, we don't believe there was multiple Ice, ice Ages and things well, like that. Well, yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, I believe in a single ice age falling forward. But, um, but the point I was asking is that, um, that that these fossils, do you think that some of these were formed during the flood or do you think some of these flood after or it just, just varies? Uh, yeah, the, the um, I, sorry, I just, just distracted them. Um... Uh, yeah, or something. Give me just. A uh, no, the, 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 it's a very, it's a very good question. Um, the to know where they were formed in the flood, you, you would know the need to know the sort of the flood post flood boundary where where the deposit related to the flood, and what are the deposits are related to the post flood, what are related to the ice age, and and things like that. Uh, you know, I I don't pretend to know. I wouldn't say that hundred percent. All fossils of these these ancient fossils, whether Australopithecus or Homo erectus, that they ha that they're hundred percent are post flood, but but I I work on the assumption that they are, but you know it, it to to me it wouldn't it wouldn't really make that much difference, although if if there were some pre flood, if they were the result of the pre flood, it'd probably kind of. Uh, even make it easier to explain because, but but post flood, but I, I work on the assumption that they are post flood, but I I don't think I can answer that question, you know, that because you know I'm not a geologist and I don't think right. the, the the boundary has been settled yet, and and some of these where the 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 thing the interesting thing is some some of these fossils are found, uh, you know, buried at hundreds of meters under sediments, and so you. So you kind of wonder, so so you make sure you know, like in Africa or whatever, they're buried under 100 meters of sediments and, and which have been kind of eroded away. Maybe maybe a runoff from the flood or from or from the ice age. I, I don't know, but I, I I sometimes wonder whether some of them were actually a uh, result of the flood or somehow the flood. So that I I'm open to that possibility, but I just don't know. But that, that's not my area of expertise. That's fine. Um, all right. Um, we're going to move uh, past uh, uh, question 18 because we already dealt with Homo habilis. Um, yeah. All right. Homo uh, hyobergensis. Exactly. What is that? Uh, well, I showed you one before. So a lot a lot of I, I kind of view Homo hyobergensis as just a, a larger variant of Homo erectus because they generally had larger brains. So remember I said if they had if they have these robust features and uh, a larger brains, they tend to go now in the home hydal against category, which is sort of um, a bit like um, Homo habilis uh, was a sort of a waste basket category where they put things in. Uh, some call it a garbage bag because they couldn't fit it in anything else. The same as the Homo hydal against is they they uh, uh, they sort of brought this species name out of retirement. It was sort of well, it wasn't used much as it was. Because a jaw was found, you know, a long time ago, and then they call it Homo hydrogensis. So actually, the type specimen is a, is a jaw, and they brought it out later on to classify a lot of specimens that they found sort of in the sort of middle, what they call the middle Pleistocene period, which is sort of around a couple hundred thousand years ago to around mm -hmm. six seven hundred thousand years ago, and in their evolutionary timeline, 
And so it's like specimens like these. So this is Rhodesia man. I can show you another one. This is uh, the, the Bodo skull. Um, this is this is from um, Ethiopia. So basically, uh, uh, it sort of has a hammerectus like too. Okay, so this this was I think has a has about twelve hundred fifty cubic centimeters. So, so so well within the human range, but it has a very large face, with a robust skull, right? A very large face, that large large brain. Uh, what there's also the Atabarca finds from Spain. Um, the uh, this is the skull five, I think it is. Atabarca five, one of the most complete skulls ever found. So some say these are closer to Neanderthals, but that. Also put it in the Hydrobogensis category because it's a bit higher Hydrobogensis. So again, this, these are these are um, generally uh, sort of human brain size within well within the human range. So basically, what I'm saying is the Homo Hydrobogensis is sort of just uh, home, similar to Homo erectus, but a little bit larger brain size. So 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 they're, they're not really a trouble for. Uh, Creationists at all, because if we regard Homo erectus as human, then Homo hydrobogensis is certainly human. And even like I said, the people, the evolutionists that produce this book on the human lineage, Cartman or Smith, they group all hydrobogensis specimens, like the ones I showed you, uh, as a subspecies of Homo sapiens, because basically, um, yeah, so basically here and and. Uh, would you classify them as human? Sorry? Would you classify them as human? Um, uh, Homo uh, Heidelberg? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. You're de definitely human. Definitely human. It's, it's, it's uh, like a Neanderthals are human. They're human. And like Homo erectus are human. They're, they're, there's no, no doubt about that, that they're human. Uh, so, so, that, so they're not that really controversial um, from a creationist point of view. They, they were, again, I have those robust features. And um, you know, strong brow ridges, more, more lower cranium, and things like that. But so, so you wouldn't say that that would make them a uh, different species, exactly. You know, no, no, they 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 they, they, they they're, 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 they like like the yeah. evolutionists. They they, they classify them as a no. subspecies of, of Homo sapiens. So uh, Homo sapiens, even, uh, even if they have uh, unique features, there are. People groups today that have unique future features. Absolutely, absolutely. Like, like uh, people in the Orient, for example, Chinese and Japanese, they got some some special folds on their eyes that that makes absolute, them more Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And the thing is, I'm not going. I don't want to go into it because it gets controversial. But there are even in, I've seen photos of people in historical times which have very features similar to. Hydrobogensis erectus like features in the skulls. So it's not, it's not a sort of, it's not, I don't want to get into that. They're fully human, as human as us. And the thing, the thing is the, what uh, I think there was, um, the, the phrenology was, I think it was a 19th century thing. You know, they basically, they, they thought they could use skull features to determine whether a person was a criminal or not, all this sort of thing, pseudoscience. But that was the science of the day. You, because of certain skull features that they they could uh, identify things about a person and sort of de dehumanize them or whatever, uh, and I think that's totally wrong. And and we shouldn't sort of think it because he, he, I, I remember even, even an evolutionist once said to me when I was doing my research and on the brain stuff, uh, you, you have sort of incipient Neanderthal features on your forehead. <laughs> I didn't I didn't take offence. I mean, I but, but you know. The, th the thing is, it, it's that it's it's got nothing to do whether you're human or not. Um, <laughs> right. Um, uh, I have to ask you what this is. Uh, King was it Kenya Thropus? Uh, Ken yeah, yeah, that's well, that's a weird name. Um, exactly what is that? that? This is this is it here. Okay, so this is it again. Uh, People like Tim White, I think, basically said that this has been distorted matrix, expanded matrix distortion. So whenever it gets fossilized, I think things expanded. It was a thousand over a thousand pieces put together, and so it expanded. So it made 
part of it uh, expand, maybe maybe uh, causing some funny features like more vertical upper upper face or whatever. But now no, evolution of some sort of thing. Sorry, the human. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a copy of that's a cast of the actual fossil, not the actual fossil, but the cast of it. Well, so, that's what it is. Exactly, octopusine. Yeah. So so a lot. Yeah. So a lot of evolution is now. Even though I was saying it probably belongs in Australopithecines, and so I would, I would just put it in Australopithecines. It's a, you know, it's it it like like the Homo habilis. You just, you know, the, the, a variety of the, of Australopithecus. You know, and then where, whether that's one or more biblical kinds, that can be argued. But but it's not. There's nothing human. It, it's not human. And I mean, they, they they like to emphasize you know anything a little bit. I mean, its cranial capacity was uh, oh, it's not given here, but it was very small, and and it's. It, it was sort of allegedly three and a half million years ago, and anyhow, yeah, it's a sort of um, it's it's an Australia, it's an Australia Um, did you yeah. mention um uh, in the email uh Homo uh Antis, was that Antis Antis? yeah, this is this thing here. What is that exactly? Well, they they believe it. It's it's sort of um. Uh, it's from Spain at the at the Atabuca site. I seem to be they have this site in Spain, these caves, and I seem to be finding these things that, according to date, their dating methods that date from so it's almost a million year time range to the younger to to the earliest European fossils. It's funny how they all congregate in the same area, waiting to leave their their remains there. But anyhow, so I just uh, did a bit of a satire there, but. Um, yeah, this this was dated about over nine hundred thousand years ago. It's supposed to be one of the earlier humans, at least at a time, in in Europe. And I suppose maybe some think it may go given uh, rise to uh, whether it gave rise to the later uh, European uh, uh, specimens, uh, with uh, eventually to to, to the. Uh, whether it gave rise to a of the or in later the Homo sapiens or whatever. But this is supposed to be an early human. Uh, you can see there's not much of it. It's just um, you can see the, what the would forehead. You it's yeah, yeah. And the jaw. So it's it, another it looks, the scene or, or just another? No, 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 this, this, would be, this would be human. So so it's, they say its brain capacity would have, well, it's, you can't really tell, but it would have been over a thousand cubic centimeters. So it's in the human range. But but yeah no it's it's sort of it would it, it would be if you had it it would be human it's it's got a small face but it's a vertical face small face. Um, it's, uh, okay. You don't got much of the skull to work with. Ah, but but it, it'd be human. But you know, and there's no there's no Australopithecines in in Europe anyhow. Uh, so uh, right. Um, I think the the word Australopithecine actually means southern ape. So they were just kind of found in southern Africa. Is that right around that time? Well, yeah, happened. and then they later found them in East Africa and and, and things like that. But, but but it was originally the Tong skull found in in South Africa that was named what after. What about dinosaur bands? Uh, you mentioned them before. Yeah, they they that that it was originally a sort of finger bone that they found in some Siberian cave that they analyzed as DNA, <coughs> and they found and they kind of found that it was a sort of different from human and Neanderthals. And and sort of later analysis of, and I, I think I don't know. I think I'm, whether that was the mitoc. I'm not sure whether it's the mitochondria. I have to look. I wrote I wrote an article. So I'm on, on the on the um, creation.com website. On my because creation.com forward slash Peter hyphen line, you'll find a list of articles I publish. And I think there's one on Denison which explains the history of it. Uh, it's been a few years since I've written it, so my memory is a bit vague. Um, but they've sort of analyzed the DNA. They've had further specimens of teeth or whatever. And so they analyzed the DNA and, and they kind of, so it, it's sort of a, a human species. Uh, and I found that it basically how they work it out, I'm not entirely sure, but it interbred with Neanderthals and it interbred with humans. In fact, I found a hybrid of one specimen. Apparently, it have a, it had a Neanderthal, one Neanderthal. One parent was Neanderthal and the other one was Denisovan or something like that. So, so you have, so they were kind of these mystery humans, but 
they were but they found a jaw in all places Tibet, some some top of the mountain, some place in Tibet somewhere, something like that. And they analyzed it by proteins, which not as doesn't give you as much information to DNA, but it, it seemed to be saying that that aligns with Denisovans, but it was quite a rugged jaw, strong, robust jaw. The things that you find like in erectus or hydrogenous specimens. So, in other parts, they, they found bits of the, the skull. Uh, he had a very thick skull bone. So that that indicates that they probably were ro robust humans, like erectus, like or hydrogenous like, which I view as the same thing anyhow. And a lot of evolutionists think they may be they may be some. A lot of Chinese specimens are erectus, Chinese uh, hydrogenous like. They may be explain them and I may explain some of the Indonesian erectus Solomon and uh, Nangdong ones and but but until I get them can do a DNA analysis properly on them, can't know for sure. Or they, or they find a specimen a proper with a, a whole skull and I can analyze the DNA, you won't know for sure. But it looks like but they were clearly human because because right. if they interact with modern humans then they were I think right. I think we kind of reached the end of our time because we're. I know we kind of went three hours strong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we got kind of we, <laughs> we covered a lot of ground and and we examined these the fossils a lot more closer, uh, especially the interpretation of these fossils. So that was uh, a huge emphasis of mine to to try to explore you know, how yeah. to interpret the fossils and what they actually are, are discovering in the fossils and that sort of thing. And just kind of get, because yeah. me and Dr. Bergman went over uh, some of these things, but I wanted to do a much more closer examination of that. All right, so uh, what is your overall thoughts and conclusions regarding the whole situation with the fossils? Uh, are they transitional? Should they be used as uh, intermediates like this uh, by the evolutionist community? Um, what what is your take on it, and that's sort of thing? Just kind of give your your summary of your your of all that we talked about today, and and what you come up with in your studies. Well, I think I think I, I, look, I, I keep an eye on what comes out, like and and I, from the evolutionist community, thing like that. And, and and the one the one thing I know is that you know, so I'll, I'll admit I'm biased, but I know they're they're one hundred percent biased. So you're never gonna get. You're only going to get an alternate evolutionary views from that community, you know. So the interpretation will always, because if they ever said something, if they ever gave a non-evolutionary interpretation, like it was these these skulls were actually they didn't evolve, these these weren't ape men or whatever, or, or they weren't hominid, hominins or whatever, then they would no longer be part of that community. As simple as that, uh, you'd be kicked out. You have to. Your Darwin is is like your. Um, your figurehead and and basically so it's like a it's like a religious community in that sense and so so that i would that so, so i bit remember that when i come out with all these fossils and show that it's a totally biased interpretation no no non-evolution interpretation is even allowed it the, the media even the media everything everything and and today with everything that's going on in the world you can see that the media can be very very biased and and it's always been and 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 even if you see uh, you see a lot of stuff coming out, and I, 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 I it, and it's comparable in some way. If you see what's happening with the the gender fluidity, that suddenly in the last few years, suddenly men can become women, women can be men, men can have babies. Suddenly, that's a a fact. Now, of course, it's not a fact. God created male and female, but in a way that. A small group is trying to pressure the community to accepting that. If you go back to Darwin's day, that was that they were looking for a revolution. They wanted to kick God out of biology, and so, so in a sense, because the arguments used in Darwin's day, we know that they don't work anymore. Was and it, um, kind of saying, it's all been just sorry. I was saying, was and so basically. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was going to say, uh, was it Carl Sagan that said that you can't, uh, we can't allow a divine foot in the door? That, something I, I don't know, but I've heard that. I heard a quote. I may, yeah, it could be from him. I don't know who it was, but it could well be. And so basically, evolution got accepted on it. I did it because they didn't want God there, and so they 
except, I mean, the cell, we didn't know, the structure of the cell was largely unknown, DNA was not known, and so how could I, and so the enormous complexity, the mini universe of complexity, and even, even a cell was not known, and so basically the only thing is natural selection, but it wasn't even that invented by a creationist, and so, and that fits well within the creationist model, natural selection, uh, so that's the only thing that's left, so, but his ideas they don't work and but it was accepted on faulty evidence and so like today they and, and and so suddenly it becomes established it becomes a consensus by the majority because they want to believe that not because it's true but they want to believe it's true so it becomes true and then now you got this push today where people want to believe male coming of females females come in male, males and you're pressured into if you don't believe that you're ostracized you're kicked out of institutions that's how it works. That people got to get real. That is how things tend to work. That's how it. And so I draw that analogy of that's how maybe that, that's how evolution got accepted. Once it got into every facet of life, it's very hard to kick it out. But the thing is, arguments build up on it. You know, it it just sort of it's it's untenable now. If you look, the the from the skulls is probably the hardest argument to make. Uh, you know, for or against evolution, because if you're not dealing with DNA, but if you're looking at the, the, the complexity of life, I'm I'm a brain scientist. I know from the brain, there's there's no way there's, there's no way in in a thousand lifetimes as universe a brain a human brain could evolve, and then you it just it just beggars to belief that someone could believe that, and then so and then you have so I would believe when these ideas come out. Oh, the evolu every time a new fossil comes out, it seems that the human family tree now has to be redrawn, or this fossil overturns current ideas evolution. That happens all the time. Let, let me maybe finish with this quote by evolutionists. What um, that maybe sums up. I'll read uh, that sort of sums up a lot of what if you're evolutionists and this if you think you know the truth, then. Now, Bern, this is by Bernard Wood and Alexis Lutko. This, this was in American Science, March, April 2023, okay? So this is very recent. Now, Bernard Wood is a, is a doyen of evolution power and probably he's one of the experts of everything. And he, he's actually one of the ones that thinks that the Homo bilis should be in their own category or, or assigned to the Australopithecines. But he's an ardent evolutionist, make no doubt. And he says, popular narratives on this topic generally include explanation about how, when, and why our human ancestors' posture became upright, the gait became bipedal, their diet shifted from vegetarian to a combination of meat and plants, and their plants enlarged. Unfortunately, we have to disappoint you. Although a narrative of this type would, this type would look like an accurate account of human evolution, it would almost certainly differ from the real evolutionary history. Instead, this article will lay out reason for thinking the existing human fossil record is incomplete in almost all respects with little chance that any narrative explanation offered today can be the right one. If the human evolution story were a play or novel, many of its, of its character would be absent, misrepresented or poorly developed and the plot would have many holes. So that's, so if you, if you believe in the human evolution story, what they're saying is that that story is almost certainly wrong anyhow, not today. So what you've got to have your faith on is that some other story in the distant future will come out to be true. So my, my message would be is throw out the evolutionary story. If if it's all wrong, maybe maybe it's not because maybe it's because evolution is wrong. And maybe because God not maybe God designed human life. And he decided he put eternity in the hearts of men. And he basically he reaching out to anyone who wants to reach out to him and offer them forgiveness of sin and eternal life. And that would be my message, that instead of putting your hope in that some fictional story of evolution will be true in the future, which will, it will never come to pass, put your hope in, in, the, in the God in, who died for you, in, in the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for you on the cross, and, yeah, and, and conquer sin and death as evidenced by his resurrection. And the thing is, if God can resurrect, Something from the dead, someone from the dead. What else can't he? Cannot he do? And if God can resurrect Jesus, from, even if you are a physicist evolution and believe Jesus rose from the dead, why on earth would you believe 
God needed millions of billion years to get around to creating life if he, if he could resurrect Jesus instantly. And even Jesus could raise people from the dead. So what, what God didn't need training wheels. God was knew exactly what he was doing from the very start. So my message is put your hope in the Lord Jesus Christ because he is God. He is real. He is there. And if you call on him, he will answer you. So that's my concluding message. Yeah. And um, uh, it was Byte, actually, when it uh, that uh, came up with natural selection. So it was a creationist. But then, oh, sorry? Byte. By I think it was by yeah yeah something like that yeah yeah so so yeah, that was yeah well, that wasn't even original so mm -hmm. so basically it's, yeah yeah that's all but anyway um it has been so enjoyable having you on here I'm glad I'm glad you have all those those fossils and those casts and then yeah. just kind of just showing them and uh it's yeah. awesome I heard you uh Dr Bergman said something about you went all over the world taking pictures of these things uh, uh so well, well, well I took but I I. Not all over the world. I mean, I was in American museums and taking pictures. Uh, right. I, I didn't, I didn't use them in the book because of a certain reason. But yeah, I got a lot of pictures. But I, I sort of bought in my own copies for, for some of them too. But I have a lot of pictures. But, but yeah. So, so right, yeah. no problem. And, also, and, and, and look, thank you for taking the time and the effort. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> and, and taking also, the time and the effort of doing this, you're doing a great job. You know, people, certainly need people like you to. And and to, for putting the information out there and 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 putting a time and effort together and it'd be particularly hard when you're working and doing it. I know what it's like to work and write and do all these things and it's, yeah, it's very difficult. So good, it's a good on God bless you. I appreciate you. it. It's really um, and uh, I it, it, I love doing it. I really do. I enjoy doing it. Um, yeah. And uh, it, it, you're right. It's a lot of work to going into producing a video and. By, and getting it out there, but uh, my Genesis series has actually become really popular, so it's it's getting yeah. to a lot of people right now. Thank you again. Uh, appreciate it. Um, any final thoughts or? Uh, no, just, no, thank you for having me, and I appreciate it. And, and uh, yeah, so um, keep we could, we'll keep in touch, and I might see you to talk again awesome. in a little while. Awesome. Uh, Take care. I, and I will I will uh, send you the link as soon as it's uploaded, and also um, we can set up a time for a second interview regarding that, and I'll send you the clip and timestamps and so forth. All right, then All right. take I'll care. See God bless you. Too. God see bless. you. Bye. Bye. Right. Bye. Well, that was awesome. I'm glad you're here to, uh, to to see the interview. I know I did one with Dr. Bergman on the fossil evidence. But I wanted to take a much more closer look. And even Dr. Bergman told me that uh, Dr. Lyon was really, really the expert on, on when it comes to, to fossils and getting, and, and I wanted to get a kind of a closer examination of the fossils, the specifics, and that sort of thing. And so I thought, wow, you know, someone who, who knows the fossils, who's seen the fossils, um, who's actually studied the specifics regarding those fossils. So I thought his views were uh, very enlightening and very good. And um, um, I know that some things he said might have been a little bit controversial in terms of, you know, that sort of thing. But uh, I think that he did a really awesome job. And um, I, I know that uh, different young Earth Christians might have different ideas about the fossils and about what that means and, and the different diagram. Just kind of keep an open mind. I understand that... Uh, that everybody has their views on what they think on that. Um, that's fine. Um, and you're welcome to, to keep your views if, if that's the case. As, as Dr. Lyon told me in, in the interview, his opinions are his. You know, they, they, they represent what he thinks and uh, no one else has to 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 take his position. Um, but, uh, but it is interesting to, to kind of think outside the box and hear somebody else's view and get a, a, a better insight into these issues and that sort of thing but i loved the way he uh got really specific with it and target like when he talks about lucy hip and 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 getting right to it um uh, and he showed the the cast and he showed the uh the human uh, uh hip and he kind of put them side by side he put a chimp hit, uh uh, pelvis side by side. I mean, he basically showed it, it. These kinds of visuals really help people to to better understand 
um, uh, the issues, the the and the 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 fossils and and like I said, it it just was really really uh, good. I, I loved it. I, I was looking forward to this interview. Uh, we had that uh, last Friday. I'm hopefully going to get this video uploaded by this Friday. Uh, thank you for joining me on here uh, on the uh, on Apologetics 101 on on the Genesis series, and uh, I will see you on the next video. Thank you and God bless.